Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Ambassador uh, Lucena, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed uh, delegates, I'm really delighted to welcome you all here today for this virtual expert workshop on resilience and the ocean climate nexus, uh, which I am pleased, so pleased, to co-host together with Ambassador uh, Lucena of Portugal and my uh, dear colleague, George Moreira. So it is a particular uh, pleasure for me to kick off this event. Uh, and, uh, it is the, the first uh, mayor workshop held under the umbrella of the OECD's new flagship project, horizontal project on integrating climate and economic resilience. And as we reflect on how to make our economies and societies more resilient uh, in the face of both climate emergencies and the aftermath of the pandemic, what better place to start than the ocean? This is, this is a very important topic, the ocean and the climate are inextricably linked. The ocean is an important carbon sink and also a source of emissions through diverse uh, ocean-based economic activities. The ocean also helps to regulate the global weather, a crucial and complex process that could unravel uh, irreversibly if certain tipping points in the climate system are crossed. So the ocean should therefore be central in discussions about strengthening resilience to climate change. Additionally, coastlines provide a critical lifeline, not just for the 2.4 billion people that inhabit them around the world, but especially also for the wider ocean economy as well as global economic activities overall, such as through providing access to maritime transport and attracting a large share of global tourism. I am therefore delighted to tell you that the very latest OECD work on a topic uh, very relevant to this debate will be available very, very soon. Uh, it is a possible brief, uh, policy sorry, brief on adapting to a changing climate in the management of coastal zones. Uh, in this new paper that we will release, as I was telling you very soon, we underline the significant environmental cost that socioeconomic expansion has had for coastal areas and that has contributed <clears throat> to significant biodiversity loss and accelerated ecosystem degradation. Our paper uh, will highlight how climate change stands to exacerbate these challenges, not just threatening coastal livelihoods, uh, but undermining global economic resilience by reducing the capacity of coastal ecosystems themselves to mitigate and protect us against the impacts of climate change including extreme weather events or storm surges uh, and sea level rise. I'm very uh, much looking forward to the fruitful uh, workshop. It's a two day uh, workshop discussions over the next um, uh, day. So thank you ladies and gentlemen. And now uh, George, the floor is yours. Thank you very much Rodolfo, uh, Ambassador Lucena, uh, colleagues. I, very glad to, to join this um, uh, important seminar, uh, which is also uh, a good expression of uh, uh, collaborations within uh, the OECD uh, in this uh, uh, crucial uh, uh, topic. Uh, and to complement um, uh, Rodolfo's uh, initial interventions, and because he was already eloquent uh, uh, linking the the, the ocean uh, and, the, and, and the climate uh, crisis, I would like to focus on resilience. Um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis is severely affecting key ocean-based sectors and, and casting uh, growing uh, uncertainties on the global economy. Global poverty is set to rise for the, for the first time in 30 years. Uh, as developing countries uh, and emerging market uh, countries are being deeply impacted, including small uh, island developing states with small and undiversified economies strongly relying upon uh, highly affected economic uh, sectors such as uh, tourism or fisheries. Uh, to bounce back uh, and enhance resilience, uh, we need systemic 
transformational and urgent changes uh, that are born from the understanding of the interconnectedness of our environmental, social, political, and economic systems, as the OECD uh, NIAC has been uh, suggesting. Uh, this crisis, um, as dramatic as it is, uh, is offering an unprecedented opportunity to make that systemic change, to reset, as some call, uh, or to rebuild uh, economies, uh, activities, as to deliver a more sustainable, equitable, and resilient economy fit for everyone future and a sustainable ocean economy should be an integral part of this process uh, through what we call a blue recovery in 2019 we launched uh, the sustainable ocean for all uh, initiative and we produced a report this was again a result of an excellent collaboration between the development cooperation directorate the uh, environment directorate but also the science technology and innovation directorate which also included other colleagues from uh, the trade uh, uh, directorate. Uh, this initiative uh, contributes to a global uh, sustainable ocean economy that all countries, including the poorest and the most vulnerable ones, can benefit from. Uh, as part of this initiative, we are now developing uh, the Blue Recovery Hubs uh, to support countries accelerate progress towards a sustainable and resilient uh, recovery. And Portugal, who is co-hosting this uh, uh, seminar today, has been one of the champions of this sustainable oceans for all, but also on this uh, blue recovery hubs. The blue recovery hubs uh, will help countries develop recovery strategies to both enhance the long-term sustainability of existing ocean economy sectors and generate new sustainable opportunities that can lead to uh, economic diversification and act as an SDG multiplier across multiple uh, economic and social uh, areas. The Blue Recovery uh, Hubs uh, will also help mobilize the development cooperation support for recovery behind a common strategy uh, in a coherent and coordinated uh, fashion. Enhancing systemic resilience uh, is urgent because despite the current slowdown of, uh, in the economic activity due to COVID, demands on marine resources for food, uh, energy, minerals, leisure, uh, uh, biotechnology, or other needs of a growing global population will persist. And if pursued uh, unsustainably, this will exacerbate uh, the anthropogenic pressures, as highlighted by Rodolfo Lassi, that are already pushing the uh, ocean towards irreversible uh, uh, tipping points uh, with potentially catastrophic consequences on our life on this uh, planet. Conversely, uh, better understanding the ocean climate nexus uh, will be an important part of uh, fostering a recovery that is a systemic approach to invest sustainably in ocean related sectors to provide clean, uh, uh, renewable energy, provide food and livelihoods and enhance uh, society resilience and shared prosperity also for the world's most vulnerable and of course you can uh, uh, rely on our contribution uh, as part of this uh, endeavor in partnership with all of you and to conclude i'd like again to thank um, bernardo duarte and uh, rodolfo for uh, this partnership in this event thank you so much. thank you very much george uh, now uh, ambassador you said please Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for the for the floor, Rodolfo. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar on the Ocean Climate Nexus, co-hosted by the OECD and the Portuguese delegation. It's uh, rewarding and encouraging to see so so many participants. Let me start by thanking Rodolfo Lacy and George Moreira da Silva for the, their words and commitment, and for their team's uh, hard hard work. I would also like to thank the speakers that have accepted our invitation. Uh, this idea would not have flight if you did not accept to be a uh, part of it. And um, we need uh, your views, your expertise, and your research. Last year was has dramatically shown that uh, we need science more, more than ever. Thank you all. On the theme, since I'm not an expert, I will not elaborate on any substantive remarks. I simply want to hear your insights. 
But I wanted to flag a couple of points, first of all, um, about uh, la raison d'être uh, of this initiative. We all read with great concern the recent studies, namely those of IPCC. The, the ocean is warming up, the sea level is rising, the ocean is more acidified, and still it provides 50% of the oxygen we breathe and the proteins to sustain more than 3 billion people. We are also very concerned about seeds as they are tremendously exposed to the effects of climate change and need to boost financing to tackle these effects and to, to build a sustainable new blue economy. In brief, our current relation with the ocean is unsustainable. This workshop is about its risks on a climate perspective and about how to overcome current challenges through the mobilization of the whole uh, international community, uh, including landlocked countries. Uh, more specifically on the Portuguese general view on the ocean, I would like to highlight the relevance of the ocean climate nexus to Portugal. We have more than 2,500 kilometers of coastline, two archipelagos, a maritime history and identity, and around 4% around of GDP is coming from blue economy. I would say that ocean action is at the forefront of our daily political life at home. From ex an external point of view, we also take it seriously as the ocean is a strong and permanent pillar of our foreign policy here at OECD, at the European Union and at the United Nations as well. Um, this is not a seminar on foreign policy, but, uh, but it is an occasion to listen to scientists and researchers and to receive sound guidance on how to proceed. Um, it is therefore a contribution to the OECD horizontal project on climate resilience that Portugal supports since uh, the day one. We hope that the outcomes of these two days may constitute an important and ambitious pillar of that project, but also be part of a broader across the house contribution to the UN conference that Portugal is co-hosting with Kenya in Lisbon next year in 2022. Thanks again, Rodolfo, thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much, George. Now we will uh, uh, have the first session of the discussion will be on climate impacts and resilience in the ocean um, context. And Anthony Cox, uh, my deputy director, will be uh, moderating the session. Please, the floor is yours, uh, Anthony. Thank you very much, Rodolfo, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone online. Uh, if I could ask our panelists uh, for the first session to turn their videos and microphones on, that would be great. Um, so, as Rodolfo, uh, my name is Anthony Cox and I'm the Deputy Director for the Environment at the OECD. Uh, in this session, we will be setting the scene uh, for the remainder of the workshop, focusing on climate impacts and resilience in the ocean context. But a bit of to start with, uh, we strongly encourage people to participate uh, by posing questions to panellists in the Q&A function. And we will use the chat function, uh, sorry, and please use the chat function to con to contact the administrator if they have issues. I'd also note that the webinar is being, is being recorded so that we will be having it online on the OECD website after the event. And the agenda for our, our workshop will unfold as follows. We'll, after this opening scene setting session uh, that we're about to have, we'll be having another session today that is focused on sharing the OECD country ex experiences on ocean climate impacts and resilience. Then when we resume tomorrow, we'll be looking at policy approaches for building economic and climate resilience in the ocean context in the post COVID world and building and a session on building resilience through nature based solutions. And then we will have some concluding comments in a wrap up session. So turning to this, se this session now on uh, on climate impacts and resilience in the ocean context. As was highlighted in the opening remarks, uh, climate change is altering the ocean climate, the chemistry, circulation, sea level rise, ice and ice distribution. And coll collectively, these system changes have critical uh, impacts on the habitats, on the productivity, the biodiversity within the ocean 
that underpin many of the economic activities of the sea and the resilience of our economic and social systems that are dependent on the ocean. And the key words here are systems and resilience. And we'll be diving deeper into these issues uh, with the help of three highly qualified pa panelists who I'd like to introduce now. We have William Hines, who is the senior advisor and coordinator of the new approaches to economic challenges unit at the OECD. Helena Martins, who is a science communicator with the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. And Ron Eggles' daughter, who is a marine ecologist with the Marine and Freshwater Research Institute in Iceland. So we'll have some, uh, in, some initial questions with uh, our panelists, and then we'll be posing questions that come from the audience. So please don't hesitate to throw some questions into the Q&A function uh, and, and we'll uh, pose them to the panelists as soon as we can. William, if I could turn to you, to, to, to you first. Uh, your work at the, at the OECD has been very much focused on systems thinking and systemic resilience of complex systems. We know that the ocean itself is a complex system, especially when we consider that uh, in the relationship to climate change. Um, and we've seen lots of reports on this from major bodies such as the IPCC and the high level panel on the ocean. From your perspective, how can we bring these broader concepts of systems res resilience to this critical intersection of ocean resilience, climate resilience and economic res resilience? Sure, uh, well, thanks Anthony and thanks to the organizer. This uh, it looks like a great meeting and uh, very glad to be part of it. Uh, we recently wrote a paper which asked the question, do economists ever learn outside of crises? And uh, the answer to the question is probably no, uh, that we have to be continually subjected to different crises before we really, we really change the way we understand the way our system works. And essentially to understand resilience, we, it's all about the system, the design features, uh, how systems operate, how they're managed, how they can organize, uh, what type of shocks they're subject to, what kind of network structure. And we've gone through several crises in recent years which have illuminated the different systems that uh, shape our, our lives. The global financial crisis was like an X-ray on our systems. And it indicated a kind of broken bone between the financial system and the real economy. And uh, we didn't understand some of the uh, instruments that were being used in the financial markets. Uh, we needed to think about capitalizing our financial institutions. We need to think in terms of networks and how some institutions were too big to fail or in some cases too connected to fail. Uh, the, in contrast, the COVID crisis is more like uh, an MRI in that it really shows us the deep interconnections and the complexity where you can have cascading failures and uh, failures can spread across the whole economy and into different subsystems and systems. And uh, we've seen that, for example, in global value chains, just how fragile and vulnerable it was to even access very basic commodities during the crisis, because we've changed the structure of production in recent years based on efficiency to make sure that we can produce goods uh, cheaply. And in a way that's led to market concentration which means there's very little vulnerability if particular nodes in the system go down. And it means you don't have a linear change in output, but uh, a nonlinear cascading shock. And that was very much evident uh, when it came to the uh, even basic materials like uh, PPE and uh, medical equipment and so forth. Of course, now we're entering into a period where we'll be dealing with a permanent crisis of climate change, ecosystems, uh, biodiversity loss, et cetera. And there's a real opportunity again to use this to upgrade our understanding of the system, to design things better, to intervene in ways that can ensure that uh, the systems are resilient and to think about the concepts, uh, the modeling approaches that we have so that we're better simulating how these systems evolve, how they change and how they break down. But also it's important in terms of narratives. And um, my second point is, if we think about the economic and financial system, then the way we've generally thought about economic systems is that they're closed equilibrium systems. They tend to get knocked off track by a shock, usually an exogenous shock, but they will gravitate back to some sort of uh, resilience. So they've got dynamics within them that are essentially self-stabilizing. 
Now, I think the, the real world is more complex than this. And uh, the, um, the global economy itself is made up of uh, global production networks of 50 million firms with billions of physical links interacting with household networks, uh, 2 billion households, 3.3 billion workers, trillions of links to consume products, a web of contracts in the trillions, and ownership patterns where a few firms and individuals own almost everything. So this type of system is inherently intricate and interlinked through financial markets, global supply chains, social networks, but all based on that social, uh, that shared socio-ecological foundation. So we're very much dependent on nature and the environment for these systems to function and operate. And uh, so these systems then are, a feature of them is that they are subject to crises and cascading failures that can emerge from a variety of sources, whether it's financial crises, natural disaster, geopolitical tension, cyber attacks, pandemics, et cetera. And as policymakers, there's a tendency to think about the trigger. You know, what's the next trigger that's gonna cause this cascading shock across our economic and human-made systems? But we should probably think more about the, the system and how it could be designed to be resilient uh, and how there are interventions that we could take in the event of a shock uh, to restore the system and, and its functioning and capabilities. So these are economic and financial systems and we're continually trying to optimize these, these systems. And when we optimize complex systems, we can destabilize subsystems. And so it's, uh, OECD, we're a very positive organization. We like to emphasize increasing productivity, innovation, growth, but there can be a, a destabilizing impact of those policies on the system. And so we need to think about the sensitivity and uh, how uh, the system will evolve. The third point is ecosystems uh, themselves and how resilient are, is a system like the ocean. And uh, a good way of thinking about ocean resilience is uh, an idea of ecosystem equilibria as a characteristic of what are called basins of attraction, where the components and characteristics of a, of a system drive it towards a baseline state of health and performance. So if we think about the oceans, as, and, as uh, Anthony said, they're a huge and complex ecosystem with a tremendous diversity of flora and fauna whose uh, roles in complex food webs have been reinforced by millions of years of evolution and adaptivity. So for instance, if they are hit by a shock, like uh, a localized oil spill, uh, they do have the ability to reorganize. And from the point of view of ecosystem health, it's unlikely that um, such a, a disruption would cause dramatically and permanent shifts in the uh, species dynamic and food webs, which prevail across most of the ocean. So the system itself can absorb a shock like that and it can reorganize and recover uh, quite quickly. But um, as our earlier speakers have said, the oceans are now subject to constant exposure to trillions of microplastics. And we could think, for example, of the Pacific trash vortex, uh, continuous chemical and radiological contaminants, uh, bleaching of the, coral, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, radiological runoff from Fukushima, for example. And there's a real threat that the system equilibria can be jolted in a manner that favors a differing basin of attraction. So ultimately, it seems that we're moving in the direction, uh, particularly in the Pacific, uh, where huge regions of oxygen depletion are contributing to these dead zones in which uh, virtually no marine life can survive. So that's also a resilient system. And uh, there's a resilient system which is diverse and can adapt. And then there's a resilient system which is essentially like a dead zone and is difficult to recover and adapt. So uh, the cause of these things can be low probability, high consequence events, uh, which are difficult to predict via conventional modeling techniques. Uh, a good example is a, a solar storm knocking out communication systems, for instance. And other triggers, and the one I think we'll be talking a lot with regard to the oceans, are more chronic in nature. So the gradual events, the uh, global warming, the slight overfishing within uh, a given ocean or sea, Initially, they may have quite a limited impact, but uh, eventually they can overwhelm and be unstoppable in their effects. So we really have to be careful of these slow moving chronic systemic threats because they're almost imperceptible uh, in their early stages. So there are real risks in terms of these ecosystems and how they can change. And my fourth point is to think about the, 
the interaction of these two complex systems, the economic and the ecological. And uh, we can think of that in terms of fishing, which I've mentioned, pollution, which I've also mentioned, and optimizing the ocean economy. And uh, often we think of optimization as in terms of trade-offs, that uh, you know, we have to generate certain incomes from various different parts of the ocean economy, but we also have to be careful about sustainability. So we have to manage a series of trade-offs. But as I mentioned, because of these nonlinear dynamics, oftentimes the trade-off approach works better when you're dealing with two linear functions. And that we saw this during COVID that when policymakers tried to trade off some of the infection rate for opening up the economy a little bit, it wasn't that you had a linear increase in infection rate, but uh, a nonlinear exponential increase. So managing these systems is actually quite tricky. Um, an example of ecological uh, economic interaction is uh, something I've just written with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers on the Texas energy grid failures in February due to an Arctic blast. And the reason is because um, essentially you had designed a, a, an economic system based on deregulating the energy market where energy producers, about 60 firms, competed using a, a public grid and uh, the idea was they would compete on price, so they'd be innovative, and uh, this would generate electricity cheaply for consumers. And so it's an efficient system. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, energy providers tended to underinvest in the, the value chain for natural gas, in winterizing the grid. And so when you get hit by uh, an Arctic blast, uh, which uh, we would think will become more common in the future, the, uh, the system basically collapse because you have no redundancy in the system and the, the system is not able to reorganize. So we optimize the economic performance of the system, but then we're undermined by the ecological aspects of it. And uh, William Hogan, who designed the deregulation uh, for Texas, he said that the market functioned as it was supposed to because when it was hit by an Arctic blast, the price of electricity went up by 10,000%. And uh, he would say this is a good thing because then consumers will uh, cut back on consumption and that'll take pressure off the system. Unfortunately, during an Arctic blast, you don't really have much choice about whether you have the heat on or not. So we have these rolling blackouts and uh, partial collapse. So we really need to think about how we design these human-made economic systems with nature and the environment in mind and to ensure that they can resist these types of climate shocks. Coastal defense is another uh, useful area to think about. And um, when we think about resilience, there's uh, different ways of looking at defining that, but it's basically how we prepare for different shocks, how we absorb a shock when it occurs, uh, and then recover and adapt from that shock. And we've applied that in various different issues like global value chains, financial markets, and it would be really interesting to think about those categories in terms of no oceans, uh, optimizing economic and uh, ecological interactions and coastal defense. But also it's important to look at the different spheres uh, for resilience, the, the physical domain that's uh, like rebuilding infrastructure after a shock, uh, preparing it and making sure that it can recover. Um, there's informational needs as well, uh, ensuring that we're forecasting the weather accurately, improving the science base, understanding the different trade-offs there's the cognitive and social, which is about communicating, uh, education, uh, participation of the community and recovery plans and things like that. And then there's a whole set of metrics, checklists, expert judgments, system redundancies and threats, which we can quantify and we can better understand. Uh, but we can also think about the re resilience by design and resilience by intervention features. And it would be really interesting to really uh, build that up in terms of a lot of ocean systems. So I look forward to working with you all on that. And uh, just a final point is that uh, sometimes resilience is used to reassure people that uh, you know, we can manage a lot of these uh, changes in systems and the features of complex systems. But um, systems can be very fragile and uh, oftentimes there will be failures. And the, in the case of the dead zones, it, the question is whether these are irreversible failures. So resilience uh, shouldn't be used as a way of escaping some of the very fundamental uh, and difficult debates that uh, policymakers makers are going to uh, face. Thanks. Thanks a lot, William. And uh, and your last few points there were particularly 
uh, salutary reminders uh, that resi that resilience is not a is not a, a safe haven necessarily. Um, and and I would particularly uh, uh, liked your characterization of the policy challenge as being uh, well, one of the elements of the policy challenge being are we focusing on on uh, resilience by design or resilience by intervention? Are we focused on adapting or just uh, reacting? Uh, so, Helena, if I could turn to you now. Um, you recently co-authored a very timely article uh, with the evocative title of The Quiet Crossing of Ocean Tipping Points. Now, this article focused on the potential for high probability, high impact tipping points in the ocean caused by cumulative impact, warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. Perhaps you could elaborate on the and what they mean for ocean climate res resilience, diving into this in a little more detail. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. So yeah, tipping points are kind of a buzzword. We heard it sometimes now today. Uh, and we, so climate researchers have, are paying a lot of attention to it, but also the media. And William Folk I mentioned these high impact, high, uh, low probability events, which are often those that appear on the media. When uh, every now and then we hear about the potential, potential over, uh, collapse of the overturning meridian Atlantic circulation, or the collapse of the uh, Antarctica ice shelf. Uh, so th those are events uh, triggered by tipping points, which are of course very uh, impactful. But first, before moving on to what we looked at in the article, I think it would be important to uh, mention a bit what exactly are these tipping points, because everyone is talking about it, but maybe not everyone is mentioning, is thinking about the same thing. So uh, tipping point is, is a term that has been used in mathematics and chemistry for a long time, meaning the change of a stable system to a new different stable system, which happens after you cross a point, a so-called tipping point, which you can no longer go back, which makes it very difficult or impossible to go back. And then around 20 years ago, the IPCC uh, introduced this, uh, this term also in climate science. And I'm now going to share my screen for a while, just to show uh, a scheme that helps, I think, um, in understanding or putting some uh, pictures in the abstract concepts that we are talking about. So in climate, what does this mean, this tipping point? So we can consider that, oh, I'm, I'm going to put this in presentation mode. Okay. So um, we have now the current climate, which is here, this blue circle. And we are in this stable system, a stable climate. And what is happening is that, is that we are forcing the climate uh, away from this equilibrium state. And this forcing is something that actors, uh, uh, that changes the climate. In our case, we are talking about increased concentrations of greenhouse gases. So these increased concentrations are moving the climate away from its stable uh, position to a new, different, far away, coming further and further away from that equilibrium. Until we reach this certain point, this cold tipping point, in which uh, the slightest change, the minimum change can lead to an abrupt movement towards a new state, a new equilibrium. And what is special about these tipping points or crossing these tipping points in that is that then it is very difficult to go back. So even if we eliminate this forcing, even if we stop emitting CO2, even if we suck CO2 from the atmosphere, it will be very difficult to go back to a previous state or even impossible when we are talking about timescales that have interest for us humankind thousands of years. And also it's important to distinguish this uh, from climate feedbacks, because sometimes there is some confusion in the use of these terms. So they are, of course, related. And it's, it's due also to the existence of these climate feedbacks that we are pushing our blue circle towards the yellow, these, because these feedback loops are 
increasing this or uh, reinforcing this initial push. Uh, and so I give you an example of a, an easily relatable climate feedback. Uh, that starts, of course, as everything in climate with greenhouse gas emissions from our human activities that lead to this warming of the climate system. So the temperature increases in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and what happens is that we have more evaporation. So we will have more water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, and a warmer atmosphere is capable of holding more water vapor. And it happens that water vapor in itself is a greenhouse gas. Many people don't know about it. It's not as powerful as CO2 or methane, but it's very abundant and it's, it's a relevant greenhouse gas. And so increasing its concentration will produce an additional warming. And this additional warming instead, in turn will lead to further evaporation and so on and so on. So these cycles repeat themselves again and again. And it's the existence also of these cycles that helps uh, crossing the tipping points. So going back to the paper, uh, uh, so there are these huge spectacular events that get the attention of the media, but are still not very well known. Um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding their possibility of happening or not. But then there are others, um, and, and, and also before, uh, and this fact that this high impact and spectacular events have caused this feeling in politicians, even in natural climate, uh, natural science scientists, and uh, um, that, okay, tipping points, we don't really know much about them. They are very unlikely. Let's not worry about it. This is in the field of probability very, very far away. But what happens is that there are a lot of things happening in our oceans already, and that we called in our paper, in our paper, we called it silent tipping points, because they are already taking place. They are already happening. They're already having a lot of impacts on the ocean system, but we are kind of distracted. Uh, we don't feel them. We don't live in the ocean. We don't really pay a lot of attention on a daily basis. And so they are going on and noticed. And this uh, crossing of these tipping points is related with the fact that the oceans are a huge and a vital part of our climate system. Because as already mentioned here today, so the oceans have absorbed 30 to 40% of all the CO2 that we have emitted since the Industrial Revolution and have absorbed 93% of the heat produced by these emissions. So this comes with a high cost at the ocean. The ocean is providing us this enormous service that makes that the temperature that we feel today isn't even higher than we are already feeling. But it, this comes from with a high cost to the ocean in the form of warming, acidification and loss of oxygen. And when we talk about warming, it's very easy uh, to relate because we all have, we human beings and all living beings have this optimal temperature range where we live. And if this uh, temperature crosses this optimal value, we will have first troubles uh, in reproducing, in growing. Um, and, and what is happening is that in the ocean, they are very sensitive. Uh, species. And the very well known case is the coral reefs, the tropical coral reefs. And we have the example in Australia, with the die off with the bleaching and the die off of the corals, because they are extremely sensitive, even to small increases in temperature. And you can think, uh, okay, it's a pity, it's a really nice environment, it will be a loss of a touristical attraction. But okay, uh, we can go on. But it's not that so it's all the, the, the services that these coral reef systems provide will disappear. They are nurseries for fish. They are super important for coastal protection. All of this is at stake because of ocean warming. Then there is loss of oxygen, which is related with this warming because warmer water uh, is, uh, has a lower, sol lower solubility to oxygen. So again, organisms will not thrive in regions where there is not sufficient oxygen. And to add to this loss of oxygen uh, provoked by climate change, we have the addition of nutrients that comes from our land activities, from agriculture, from wastewaters. They are amplifying this effect. And then we, will also, we also have acidification. So the, ocean, the CO2 is not only capable 
of changing the radiative balance of the Earth, it also alters the, the chemistry and the pH of the ocean water. And there are lots of organisms vital to the food chain, so base organisms that provide the food to, uh, through the food chain uh, that are highly sensitive to pH changes. So they have uh, either shells or skeletal structures that are sensitive to this. And what we are already seeing in our oceans is that this combined effects of warming, deoxygenation and acidification, they are not happening right now everywhere all over the oceans, but they are happening regionally, but they are mounting up and adding up to overfishing and uh, excess nutrient from land in causing possibly the tipping point of some parts of the pressing of the tipping point in some parts of the oceans. Um, so it's, they, they are silent, they don't come spectacularly, they don't show up in the news, but they are having already huge effects and we predict that it will be, it will continue. Of course, it will depend on the path that we follow in the, in the very next years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena, and, and the, this uh, important distinction between tipping points and feedback loops is, cr is critical, and of course the two are interconnected, but it's very, very good to get a, a, a handle on, on, the, uh, on, the fun, on the fundamental issues around the, the, t the tipping points, so thank, so thank you very much for that. If I could bring you into the conversation now, Ron, uh, your, your work at the Institute is focused on understanding how large scale, envir large scale environmental changes alter the functioning of marine organisms and ecosystems, in particular the potential implications of ocean acidification in high latitude marine regions. Perhaps you could, you could elaborate on the different ways that climate change is expected to impact these ocean, these ocean ecosystems and the economic activities that, that depend on them. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Um, so to answer your question, it, well, I would like to take uh, fisheries for an example. So we're already seeing a shift in the distribution of fish ranges uh, from cooler marine, uh, from, from the warming marine regions to cooler marine regions. And this you can see in many fish species, especially here in Iceland, uh, this is quite evident. And this is a result of higher temperatures in the ocean. But this is just a very simple version of the story. In fact, like Helena and William mentioned before, the story is a lot more complicated, uh, as we heard. So the fish and the whole suite of diverse organisms that play a role in the ecosystems that are a foundation for, for, for maintaining healthy fish populations uh, do not really always respond to these environmental changes in the same way. So there's a diversity in the response of organisms within the ecosystems that lead back to the fish species we're thinking about, the species we want to harvest, and the fishing industry that harvests that species. For example, although the distribution of a fish population may shift northward in the northern hemisphere, the optimal prey species of that fish may not respond in the same man manner. So what I'm trying to say here is, is we have a very complex situation on our hand in terms of what is the response of marine ecosystems to climate change. And I want to give you an example. So there's a concern that the Atlantic cod fishery may face a related problem here in Iceland, as the one I was just telling you about. Uh, the Atlantic cod population, our most important fish species here in Iceland, is actually not expected to be affected much by elevated temperatures directly. It's, it's quite near its optimal temperature range here in Iceland. So even if the temperature rises a few degrees, we do not expect uh, a big movement of the cod population out of our waters. However, the optimal high energy prey species for the Atlantic cod here in Iceland is capelin, which is a more cold water adapted species. And the abundance of capelin in Icelandic waters seems to decrease with elevated temperatures. So there is this real concern that the declining capelin populations could negatively affect the Atlantic cod fishery here in Iceland. So there is this complexity in predicting the effects of ocean warming on marine industries that rely on healthy ecosystems because of the diversity of responses of, in organisms 
within those ecosystems. And these organisms, all, many of them play vital roles. So that's the point I'm trying to make here. It's, it's difficult to predict what will happen. And on top of that, uh, this is just a simple version of the story, the warming and the movement of the fish. It's probably what we know the best because we monitor fish quite well because of fisheries. So the fish and all the organisms that play a role in the ecosystems are not only experiencing changes in temperature, they're experiencing a whole range of environmental changes like uh, both William and Helena mentioned before. And the degree of environmental changes vary significantly between marine regions. So what we're thinking about in this workshop is these global changes, climate change uh, leading to global warming, or part of it is global warming, uh, changes in weather, heat waves, increased stratification of the water column, deoxygenation. And on top of that, we have this global change, which is ocean acidification. That is the uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, which is causing uh, chemical changes in the ocean, the pH or the acidity is increased, the pH is going down. So this is uh, also affecting the calcium carbonate saturation state. So basically a whole range of uh, environmental changes that are happening all at the same time, they're all global changes, but we need to look at it at a regional scale. So although these changes are many, in many ways are global, they're not uniformly distributed around the globe. So in some regions, for example, high latitude regions, we are seeing much greater rates of warming and ocean acidification than mid latitude regions. But we have colder waters. So oxygen concentration is usually quite high compared to in warmer waters. So deoxygenation is not a huge problem here. Whereas other regions, uh, deoxygenation can be quite a big problem when the oxygen concentrations are naturally low in the waters. And there maybe deoxygenation is the biggest problem or plays the largest role in shaping uh, ecosystems in the future. Whereas here in Iceland, we expect it to be elevated temperatures and ocean acidification. So this is very important when thinking about policy, the policy framework and dealing with climate change is it's not a uniform change everywhere in the ocean. The ocean is quite diverse in terms of its environment and ecosystems within those environments. So different marine regions will be affected differently by climate change and ocean acidification. Now, if we look at marine industries, to answer the question, how does it affect industries such as agriculture, many, many fisheries and shellfish farming, uh, most of them operate in coastal areas. Uh, I think Helena came and mentioned this as well, uh, where human activities are already shaping ecosystems on regional or local scales. For example, through eutrophication, the, the massive flow of nutrients into the waters, plastic pollution is a problem, various other pollution, chemical pollution, habitat disturbance through bottom trawling, etc. So we're already shaping the ecosystems and their environments, the whole environments already on a regional local scales in more scale in most coastal regions. So as Helena mentioned, it's important to take into account these regional and local stresses when thinking about climate change. We can't ignore the fact that we're already changing the environments in different ways uh, because these large scale changes, uh, you know, they can't be mitigated through uh, altering, altering, altering how we affect the ecosystems on a local or regional scale. So again, the reason why we need to take into account local stresses is that by removing one stressor or limiting one stressor, let's say uh, disturbance from pollution, an uh, organism or ecosystem may be better equipped to deal with larger big changes that we can uh, less easily uh, deal with. For example, climate change or ocean acidification. So if you limit the pollution, for example, uh, in that region, that ecosystem may be better equipped to deal with global climate change. So it's very important to think on our regional and local scales because we can manage, you know, mitigate better on these scales than on global scales. So we need to think about how to reduce stress on ecosystem in general under the climate change scenario. On top of that, obviously, the first goal is to uh, decelerate climate change through uh, 
limiting the amount of CO2 going into the, into the atmosphere and, and then ocean. And the ocean sector needs to be a part of that change. So if I could just summarize, uh, so we're expecting certain trends in responses of mine ecosystems to climate change. But when it comes down to predicting the effects of climate change in ocean acidification on various ocean sectors and industries, we really need to establish a good understanding of the environmental changes that are likely to be major stresses in ecosystems in different regions. The effect of climate change is going to vary between regions and the environmental setting of a particular industry that, that a particular industry operates within needs to be considered. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Ron, and I and, uh, really do appreciate the, the focus you or the focus you provided on, on making sure that we consider the regional and local scales as well as the global, the global scales. We, in these discussions about big complex systems, we often lose sight of the fact that uh, many of these impacts are very local in nature uh, due to the local ecosystem, the local ecosystem. So that's a very good examples there. Um, we are starting to get some questions in from uh, from the um, uh, or from the audience, and we'll turn to those in just one minute. Uh, I, I, but if I might ask um, uh, each of the each, each, each of the panelists to reflect on, on on this question, maybe you can each give a, your different perspectives on it. Well, one of the things that we hear in your presentations is that these are large and complex systems, large and complex systems with with a lot of moving parts, a uh, lot of unknowns. So what we're really into is decision making under deep uncertainty in 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 many cases. Are are we uh, equipped to be able to make those kinds of those kinds of discussions? How? How are the uh, academic and, 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 and policy makers in, in your particular areas coming to deal with this kind of this decision making in, in complex and, un and uncertain areas? Is, because this goes to the heart of the resilience uh, management question. Will, maybe if I could turn to, turn to you first. Sure, and maybe uh, I'll incorporate in my response the answer to. Uh, Duarte's excellent question about estimating in precise economic value the cost of no action. Um, well, I can't speak for ocean specifically, but of course the attempts to uh, get a sense of how much climate change will affect the economy is uh, a very um, active field of debate. And uh, the idea of soft linking biophysical models to economic models, particularly general equilibrium frameworks, to try and get a sense of how uh, much global GDP will be affected by climate changes over the next uh, century, half century, etc. has been going on for uh, at least a decade and a half. And of course, Nick Stern, in his uh, famous report, uh, I think got a lot of that debate going. And it's a controversial area because, of course, um, there is a question about whether these uh, economic uh, models are reactive enough to the types of change we see in the uh, the uh, environmental side, because if we assume it's a general equilibrium framework, then it is self-stabilizing. So regardless of what type of shock it's hit with, it will tend to recover or adapt to that shock. And so the estimates can often be quite low. And yet there are so many scientific, technological and policy uncertainties that you, you mentioned, Anthony. And uh, I think that the, we'll never have a precise answer as to what is the impact. We can have ranges of values. Uh, we can have uh, a plurality of different models that will help give us a sense of that. But uh, I think Ben Bernanke, of course, went through the last global financial crisis and, and was a policymaker at the time. He said that the, the best approach for dealing with this uncertainty is to make sure the system is fundamentally resilient and that we have as many failed safes and backup arrangements as possible. So this is, uh, a real challenge, but uh, given the uncertainty, we probably should err on the side of uh, safety and the precautionary principle, because these systems, uh, as uh, the other speakers were saying, once we get beyond tipping points, it won't be possible to recover them. So I think that's uh, some ideas there. 
Thanks very much, William, and, and, and thank you for also mentioning the precautionary principle, which is, of course, is one of the, uh, which got us early airing at the OECD as part of its, uh, its work back in the, a few decades ago. Helena um, and, and Ron, your thoughts about this, this complexity and, dis and decision making under deep uncertainty from your perspectives in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the science world? Helena first, perhaps. Yeah, so if we are waiting for the day where we know everything about the science, the ocean, the impacts, we will never get there. We will never make any decision. Uh, it's like uh, future climate. We have these different scenarios which we will probably follow. High emission, low emission, midterm emission. Even if we knew exactly what happened at the end of each line, we wouldn't be able to reach, reach a decision because different regions will be affected in different ways. So we will be fighting for each one towards its side. So we know enough, that's what I say. We don't know everything, but we know a lot and we know enough to act. And the first action is, it was already mentioned here today by Ran. it's as simple as cutting down emissions as soon as possible, as quickly as possible. That is the first step. And then the second or another step, I'm not saying this in an order well, the first is really CO2 reduction. That's, that's a, an obvious one. But then we have to break down, and now I'm pushing to my communicator side, side we, and we see already that there are barriers in communication that we have to bring down. And it's not just as scientists towards the politicians, towards the public, it's also the scientists, social scientists, fishery scientists, ecological scientists, uh, we have to bring down the barriers uh, between us because we cannot each one be working in its niche and then hoping that a miracle happens and it all comes together towards a common objective. So we have to cooperate among each other. We have to, uh, all of us be aware that looking at the social, looking at the economic, looking even at the ecological side of things, it's not enough. We have to bring this together with under the cap that we realize that biodiversity is vital for the ocean, for the ocean a safe mode of operation and, and for the climate and for our uh, safe mode of operation. And then there's also communication towards the public. And Duarte posted a question, are we doing enough in our communication towards uh, the, the general public? And my clear answer is no. And I give you this example of the ocean, not only the warming, uh, but the absorption of CO2, but the heat that the ocean has been uh, storing. So I am someone that always, I was always interested in science. I took an environmental engineering degree, then I took a PhD in air quality modeling, and five years ago, I wasn't aware that the ocean has absorbed 93% of the heat. I was nowhere close to this number. And we worked here some uh, with a lot with schools, with high schools, uh, uh, science classes, and we have this initial contact with them, breaking the ice, and we have this quiz, this climate quiz. And this was a question that I wanted to have there because I had the feeling that they, they didn't know about this. And some, so less than 15% of the students got this question right when I gave them three options. Is it absorbing 30% of the heat we have produced since the beginning of the industrial red revolution? 30, 50, 90, and the majority goes to 30 or to 50. So we are not doing enough. We, and if we, people don't know, people don't care, people don't act. So it's not, and I'm not saying that we sh should follow this deficit model of throwing information to, to people and hope that they care suddenly and they act, but this is, is the beginning. So we have to be better in climate literacy. And that is also the responsibility of big international organisms like the IPCC. If we, have, if we want to tackle this uh, tipping points, we have to follow very closely the temperature in the oceans, the loss of oxygen, acidification. So we have to move beyond the traditional metrics of increase in surface temperature, global surface temperature, or increase in CO2 concentrations. And we have to look and we have to talk about these conditions in the oceans also. 
Thanks, Holly. Uh, Ron, the same question to you, this, this, this decision making, maybe you could fold into that uh, mm -hmm. uh, response to the question that was posed by uh, uh, one of our participants, uh, Duarte, um, about the role of marine, marine, protect, marine protected areas, because, you know, one response in this great, uns great, uns great uncertainty is to, is to you know, put a, a, a ring around a particular area and say, okay, this is where we're going to draw the line and, and we'll let the ecosystems recover here in these marine, marine protected areas. Is this, is this something that, that is an, an adequate solution? And because we're starting to look at uh, a biodiversity target of you know, 30 by 30 uh, in terms of marine protected areas. What are your thoughts on, on this? I think uh, regarding marine protected areas, there's a there's a lot of good things going on, and there's a, and then there's a lot of misunderstanding, and and this is there's been a call for you know protecting 10% of the ocean, etc. But the ocean isn't just the ocean; it's it, it's we need to think about what we're protecting and where, and it's very key to have information to support those predictions. There's a lot of uncertainties still about how well protected areas, uh, how they can help us. In, in a climate change scenario, can they can they actually, you know, can we actually manage to uh, protect biodiversity in these areas? And I think yes, we can. When you should really think a lot more about protecting parts of the ocean to protect the health of the ecosystems, and then harvesting around these areas. Whereas there is still a lot of information that we are missing, and and again, we need to look at that for on a very regional scale. You know, a region isn't the same as another region. We need to think about where to protect in each region, and that would need to be happen in a in a in a kind of regional scale. Um, so, in terms of you know what to do about um, how the policies are, you know, I think you mentioned before also, you know, how how is how are different regions uh, tackling climate change in the ocean sector? You know, is there any push to uh, increase economic resilience in different regions. I think that was your question. And I, and I kind of wanted to answer that as well. Because I, what I feel has been happening in the, in the last couple of decades is that because we are already seeing the effect of climate change in ocean sectors, including fisheries or shellfish farms, there has been a huge increase in the understanding of policymakers and regulators uh, in increasing understanding that we need to actually do something about climate change in the in the marine area uh, but i think what william mentioned before is that this quickly gets very complex and difficult because designing policies and regulations that helps uh, economic resilience through flexibility of operational frameworks of the industry is very far from simple and also it's, it's quite costly. So I think this is where it stops. We have the understanding already in the system, but there's a, there's a huge problem going from understanding that we need the policies to, to creating the policies that fit this scenario because of these you know, many complexities that we're dealing with. Thanks, thanks, Ron. That's, uh, that's very interesting perspectives there to bring to the question of MPAs and, and, the, dis and the, the decision making. The, the questions are flowing in to our, to our Q&A, so I might turn to a few of the questions now. Um, and I might start with the one from, uh, one, one from Kerry Max, who uh, poses a very long question, but if I could summarize it uh, and, and boil it down to a, a core question, it's basically, this workshop is taking place in the context of, uh, of what we hope will soon be a post COVID-19 world. Um, the question from Kerry is how, how can we ensure that the global approach to ocean health learns from the ongoing failures to address COVID-19 and of course to address these very same environmental issues that have been clear since the 1960s. So basically, what can we learn from the systemic issues around the response to COVID-19 uh, for the way in which we're dealing with the ocean? Um, perhaps William might want to tackle that one first, given you've done some, some clear thinking about that on, in terms of your recent work, but 
I'm not sure Ron and Halay and Halayna may want to jump in as well. William. Yeah, well, I did touch on this in my remarks about various different human-made systems which were exposed by the COVID crisis. Initially, financial markets uh, were tanking. Uh, global value chains seized up. Uh, we did have healthcare systems being overwhelmed. And uh, I think one of the big lessons is that it really demonstrated just how fragile a lot of these uh, systems are and their sensitivity to the type of shock, but not just a shock that could be contained, but that it could actually uh, cascade from system to system. And so it was uh, the healthcare system was basically uh, unable to function because the global value chain system didn't function in making uh, goods available. And so I think it has led to uh, a sense that uh, our global systems are a lot more fragile than perhaps we had thought. And that when we try to optimize all of these uh, systems and the design them to be very efficient, we might just have tried to optimize them over a very short run uh, while compromising long-term resilience. And uh, of course, with these systems, if we, um, it's really a matter of time frame and scale, because uh, if we did optimize them over a long run, then we would incorporate these uh, types of events. Uh, and so that brings us to, I think, a change in scale from designing policies over a very short run to thinking of, about policy over a longer term. And that brings in issues of uh, ecological and climate change. Uh, so maybe the tragedy of horizons might, uh, might change in response to the COVID shock. And I think there's a, it has changed also the, the way that um, we think about economic resilience. And uh, that's a topic that was discussed uh, before and after the global financial crisis. And the way we were addressing it then was very different because we said that basically we need fiscal buffers. And if we have fiscal buffers, we can absorb whatever shock occurs. Or we uh, need to make sure that we have flexibility and competition in our labor markets and uh, our product markets. And then if there's a shock, these markets can reorganize and reallocate labor and capital to uh, absorb the shock and recover. So that was kind of the old way of thinking about uh, resilience. And I think the new way is more thinking about these systems that uh, a, an economic system can be overwhelmed by what happens in the ecological and climate system. So there are potentially a lot of lessons uh, in that regard. Uh, and as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, we're only good at learning lessons during crises. So maybe this is the crisis, the climate and the oceans needed. Never waste a good crisis is a, is a, a good catchphrase here. Uh, Ron or Helena, do you have some thoughts on, on this COVID, this post COVID lessons? Um, something? Who'd like to go first? Helena. Oh, Helena, okay. Okay, it's the same. Uh, yeah, so there are certain parallels that we can uh, uh, draw between the COVID and the climate crisis. But um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of these parallels that are being crossed because they are very distinct problems. And we were hit by COVID and we quickly found a solution with some problems um of course with a lot of disinformation conspiracy theories attacks on science it was kind of a crash course in what climate science has faced in the last 30 or 40 years but then the climate uh, crisis suffers from these two aspects which is the psychological distance because it's still of course now in most recent years it's changing because there are certain extreme events that are taking place more frequently and so people's perception is changing but it's still a distant event uh, and it also it's also relates with failures in communication when we used polar bears floating on junk pieces of ice in the arctic that doesn't speak to most of humankind i would say so um and we keep talking about the end of the century this will happen this will be like this blah 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 so we won't be as, we are not being as successful in dealing with climate change as we have been with COVID, although lots of problems. So um, 
I think this was mostly useful for climate science in the, in the sense that people are realizing how the scientific method works. So you need time, you need uh, backs and forth, you need to understand, and then you rethink, and then you test this hypothesis, and you know that it doesn't work like this, and then you have a vaccine, but maybe you cannot give the same vaccine to everyone. So there's a lot of lessons and knowledges and parallels that we can take here for climate science, for science in general, and think that maybe that will be one of the biggest benefits, I hope, is that people are more in touch with the, and uh, understand better how the the science and the scientific uh, method works. Thanks, Helena. Yeah, I can uh, add very quickly to that. So I'm not an economist, I'm a biologist. Uh, so what I learned, if I just take it from my perspective, is that uncertainties seem to be the biggest problem for economists. And the uncertainties of COVID-19 crisis were great, but there way fewer than the uncertainties we're dealing with when it comes to climate change. So that's what I think the take home message is that we really need to uh, create uh, some kind of economic resilience that really takes into account the uncertainties we're dealing with. Thanks, Ron. That's very direct and a good challenge there for the economists here at the OECD. Um, I might turn to another question from the uh, audience. Um, this one I'll pick on from uh, Willem Jan Goosen, who uh, says that, um, and I'll read the whole question here. I can imagine that the risk of crossing tipping points with regard to marine ecosystems due to climate change impacts both slow onset changes as well as temporary extreme circumstances will increase if the ecosystems themselves are already under other stress such as overfishing, pollution, habitat destruction, et cetera. Is this assumption correct? And could, could you elaborate on a bit more on that? And I think this is a, probably a science question we might direct it to uh, Ron and Helena. Basically, are we more likely to tip over these tipping points to, to reach these, tip, these, tip, these tipping points if we're already under stress? We'd like to go first on that. Yeah, I think that it's, yes, it's more likely. So this, this additional uh, effects that are taking place at the same time. So this overfishing, this input uh, from, uh, from land, of nutrients from land, these all add up to this questions of uh, acidification, loss of oxygen, ocean warming. So this makes um, a soup of conditions that move, uh, that might move uh, more quickly uh, the system across the tipping point. So um, yeah, it's definitely a clear, uh, uh, the correct uh, assumption, I would say. Thanks, Ron? I have nothing to add to that, I completely agree. <laughs> okay. Um, we might, uh, uh, there are some other questions along along similar lines on on the systems question, and and this is also a question in the from the audience that goes in the discussions on climate action on land. It's becoming clear that a landscape approach is essential. Isn't it the case that the same applies to marine resilience? Might it be time to make the point that if we don't tackle the ocean as a whole, our individual actions won't likely succeed? I guess this goes to the to the point about this is a complex interconnected system and are our governance and institutional structures fit for purpose in trying to overcome what is often a siloed approach uh, to, to policy making in this space? I mean, the short answer to this is clearly yes, we must have a one in, you know, an all in one approach, but um, how, how are we seeing this take place in the, in the ocean space? Do we have insights on that? William. Sure, well, just to give you a practical example of how difficult it is to take a systems approach. When we were discussing uh, our OECD YASA task force on systems thinking, anticipation of resilience with members, which brings together scientists and economists to think through some of these systemic problems, we asked governments to identify an official from within governments who was kind of responsible or looked at systemic thinking 
And we were told that, well, we, we can't really identify anyone who deals with systemic issues, which is rather amazing given the types of systemic challenges that we face, that we've managed to break up a very big problem into a whole set of smaller problems that we then optimize or try to address. We never really aggregated back up. And uh, so I think that's the challenge. Uh, as the, the physicist Phil Anderson said once, more is different. It's not just that uh, we can take individual small problems or subsystems and look at the issues with them. It's when the subsystems interact with each other and develop these emergent phenomena. That's the real challenge. And uh, I think the, the question is, is right, that we're not really geared up from a governance point of view to deal with these types of challenges. But of course, we would advocate moving in this direction. But the structures and networks of government uh, are often, I think, uh, hindering uh, that move. Helena or Ron, do you have some thoughts on, on this perspective? So in our in the in our recent work, the paper mentioned we looked. Uh, so in the end, in a part of the recommendations, we look a bit at this, and maybe I will I will read the sentences because I I. Yeah, these are not my expertise, and uh, I will do better work if I read it. So the implementation of mitigation measures needs to be enabled through adequate government structures and seamless and integrated action. Mitigation measures must must build on adequate implementation mechanisms. Agencies ranging from instrument organizations to society sector ministries, local authorities, and networks need to work and in hand. And of course, this is all very beautiful in paper, but it's very difficult to implement. We know that even in our organizations, we have difficulties in working with other research groups, with other departments. So yeah, this uh, we are clearly not there yet. We don't have the systems in place and the collaborations in place. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Thank you, Helena. Ron. Yeah, again, I have nothing to add to that, what William and, and Helena said. I think that there are two points. Okay. So we we do have more questions uh, in the from the audience here. There's uh, one from a uh, uh, colleague, uh, Jake Rice. That is, that is long, uh, but quite interesting. So I, I, I'm not going to read it all out, but basically I'll try and summarise it. Such and it build and it builds on the discussion we've been, been having now uh, about system can systems can configurations and basically the question is 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 essentially uh, how do we know that going back to a previous system can configuration is the best outcome to address future challenges when the conditions are so uncertain basically trying to figure out uh, how our expert policy and, gov and governance processes go about picking another configuration that might be appropriate as a goal for management efforts when we're close, particularly when we're close or at, at tipping points. Anyone got some thoughts on that? No. I, I, I'm not sure I understand when uh, this wording of picking up a configuration. We cannot uh, pick up a configuration. So we don't know where we are heading. We are heading through a, to a different state. Um, there is no way how we can control which state that is and what will characterize it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I fully understand the, the question. So the, yeah, William? Well, I, I think the nature of complex systems is that uh, they do constantly evolve and reorganize. And uh, it's, we talked a bit about whether a system goes into a steady state or an equilibrium type system. But when a, a system fails uh, or collapses, then it usually fails fast and then it, um, reconfigures and, and recovers very slowly. But uh, one part of the resilience agenda is, of course, to think about how the system can adapt and what sort of interventions and uh, design features you can build in so that it doesn't just get back to the previous uh, mode of operation, but you 
in the term bounce forward, that you can actually reallocate certain resources to better address uh, and to think about the lessons of that uh, event and um, adjust uh, organizational risk tolerance, priorities, critical functions, uh, and integrate some of these lessons into how you deal with them in the future. But that's really human-made systems, uh, natural systems. Uh, we are continually surprised by what uh, natural systems uh, do and how they change, but that's because they are complex systems. So in a way, we don't have as much control or ability to manage these natural systems as sometimes we think we do. Ron, in, 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 in your uh, example, in your opening intervention, you talked about the interaction between uh, Kaplan and Cod um, and uh, the, the challenges that might, might face uh, or that might confront the Icelandic fishing industry. How is the fishing management system approaching these kind of systemic uh, challenges. Is, are they, is there signs that there are, that they are taking this um, in a uh, holistic way or is it a very much a, a reactive way? And what, and, and how, and how is that manifesting itself? I think it's still very much in a reactive way. I think, it, I don't think any system on the globe has, has managed to get there to be, you know, ready to respond to this massive uh, ecosystem changes that affect the industries, the ocean industries. And, and like everywhere else, I think here it's very reactive. So when the things, you know, when the changes to the Cape disappears, uh, you do have issues on the local scales with this income disappearing and that has economic effects. So I don't believe anyone has really reached a point with regard to uh, policy and regulation framework that you know that has already a policy and regulation framework that is that, that creates enough flexibility for the ocean sectors to deal to create the economic resilience that is needed but that is definitely needed and i think we already have the realization here there's an understanding of the need uh, but putting it in place is a is a different story and a, and a bit more complicated as william has um, mentioned We'll certainly be diving into the issues around uh, policy and uh, the experience of, of countries in, in trying to forge this, a more integrated approach to, to the oceans um, and ocean resilience in, in sessions to come. But we might, um, we might uh, stick with uh, uh, the, the more science stuff now. And, and we might pick up actually a point raised um, in, in her interventions. Um, and that's about uh, the people factor, the communications issues. A question came in that along the lines of, if I can, if I can, par can paraphrase that you know, in many cases, people know or, or, pe or people care, but they feel powerless to act. Since when we're confronted with these big systems, they're often overwhelming. Uh, and there's a little awareness of what viable solutions might be out there. Perhaps as a science, commu science communicator, can you share with us some of the solutions that you see as perhaps the most promising to raise that awareness in a, in, 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 in a policy and science environment where things are complex? Well, um... Research on climate communication is a is an is a thing that exists, so <laughs> uh, and is also evolving. And I, I don't have an answer, a definite answer to that question. I don't if I did. Oh. Uh, but what I can say is that there are. Yeah, we have, of course, this base thing, which is ocean literacy, which is still very small. Uh, still very insufficient. So we, we definitely have to increase that and we should start in, in, in school level um, with this system thinking. So not just the oceans, but everything and how it is interconnected. The way that the teaching of science is organized is not promoting this because we have biology, we have chemistry and we have physics and we have this and that. 
and we don't make the connection between this. So we we need to teach in a different way. And then, of course, we cannot put all the pressure on the individual because it's as you say. Uh, although we say no one is too small to make a difference, there is only so much that you can do. So what what we can do as individuals, and is that that I I, I when I talk when I have uh, conversations with the uh, young people is uh, talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it, to look like a nerd. Your parents talk to the adults uh, in the room um, because we have to build this feeling, this momentum that puts pressure in the politicians, pressure in the institutions to act, to take those big measures which we we as consumers cannot. So I have a life to live. I have my concerns. I cannot go to a shop and check the tags to see if it's from sustainable forests or cotton, if it doesn't have slave work. We have to rely in the institutions to allow us to make the right, the right uh, choices. So we have to put pressure in this uh, system uh, so that, uh, yeah, so that there are these two comp components, individual actions and then the big actions that we as a as the public have to support and have to pressure to, to happen. Thank you. Helena. Uh, William or Ron, did you want to come in on this question of communication? Because uh, this will be our last chance to, because uh, I think we've got only three minutes left before the next se se next session is due to start. I just to completely agree. This is the ocean literacy that needs to be increased. And it's difficult because the ocean isn't really near to our, our life on every day. But social media, I guess, could be used a lot better by also just by scientists to, you know, grab some people's attention and, and make them fall in love with the ocean, which is so important for our economies. Thank you. Okay. So Colleagues, we have uh, come to the end of our time on this opening session, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank William Hines and Helena Martins and Ron Eaglesdotter uh, for their expertise, their insights, and their and and their discussion this afternoon. Uh, I think this really does help to place the uh, overall web uh, the overall webinar in a in a context of, of what we're trying to deal with here, with a complex system, the ocean climate nexus um, is something that really is going to be key to building resilience going forward. Um, so uh, a virtual round of applause for William and Helena and Ron. And without further ado, I will hand over to the moderator for the next session, who is my colleague, Andrew Prague. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you to all the panelists for that uh, excellent session. It really got us off to, to a great start. Um, so a warm welcome from me uh, also to this virtual OECD. My name is Andrew Prague. I'm a senior advisor in the environment directorate of the OECD. Uh, and I'm also uh, coordinating the, the broader horizontal project that was mentioned in the beginning of, of this, this workshop, um, looking at uh, integrating climate and economic resilience. And I'm really pleased that we're kicking off that project with this uh, very exciting and important session about, or workshop rather, about uh, ocean resilience. Um, also give my thanks to, to Portugal um, for uh, their support and for, for co-hosting this event with us. Um, so after that excellent session, looking at the really the setting the scene for how we understand these uh, systems uh, interactions in, in the ocean context and understanding a bit about the tipping points and uh, the global effects and how they interact regionally. Um, now the idea is it will zoom in a bit uh, and look at some of the policy insights um, from some specific OECD countries. So uh, we've got three uh, countries here which are very important uh, ocean related countries all have long important historical relationship with the ocean and from those countries we have three uh, excellent and very distinguished representatives um, who will be bringing different insights on how countries have worked to uh, improve climate resilience related to the ocean and coastal communities 
um, including, of course, under the threat of, of climate change and, and the threat that that brings. And we're going to hear about this, the steps that they've been taking in those countries domestically, both in some cases nationally and subnationally, uh, and also about initiatives those countries have launched internationally to try and improve uh, cooperation. So I'm really delighted to have this panel with us. Um, I'm going to begin, uh, I'll introduce them one by one. Um, when we come to each one, we'll begin a bit like the last session. So by uh, asking each panelist a, a question really to, to kick off their insights um, and to tell us uh, what the kind of area that they're talking about in, in some detail. Um, and then we'll come back with a, with a broader conversation. And again, we'd, we'd very much welcome uh, your, your insights from the floor. And then please do use the Q&A session and um, Q&A function rather, which we have um, uh, been using well in the last session and, and that, that works well. So uh, without further ado, let, let's get going. Um, my first panelist here is uh, Vasco um, Becker Weinberg, who is a professor at the Faculty of Law of the Universidad Nova de Lisboa in Portugal. Uh, he's a professor on the law of the sea and ocean governance subjects. Um, he teaches at Portuguese, other Portuguese and foreign universities as well. Really a prominent academic thinker on issues of ocean governance and, and the law of the sea. He's written widely in particular um, on marine spatial planning and its use internationally. So in that context, uh, Vasco, please, uh, could I ask you, given Portuguese's, Portugal's rather extensive experience in developing and using marine spatial planning in particular, please can you tell us a bit more about that tool, how it's been used in Portugal as a tool to improve resilience and the implications internationally of that. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, thank you um, also to uh, um, OACD and, of course, to the Portuguese delegation for the kind of invitation and to all that are listening. And my city thanks for uh, taking the time to be here with us uh, this afternoon. Um, well, the, I think that the, following your generous uh, introduction um, and being my field precisely the law of the sea and marine special planning, I feel that sometimes we miss the overall picture of how these things should come together. Essentially, the question, how can marine special planning contribute to climate resilient ocean economies? How do we combine these realities? Ocean, uh, climate change impacts, the, the use of the ocean and uh, moving onwards with developing the ocean and its potential. But we have to lay some of the groundwork first. The climate change is undoubtedly one of the biggest threats, uh, not only uh, towards the ocean, but to humankind in general. Uh, on the one hand, humankind and human action is one of the major threats to climate and the ocean, uh, but also the ocean, uh, as it gets busier, suffers more and more from those uh, threats, namely increasing traditional uses, but also new usages and activities. Human impacts undoubtedly change uh, and affect the ocean. And with that, also the way the world economy works and it affects our daily lives. We and our own generation have witnessed how these changes have impacted us on a huge scale. However, the good news is that the ocean is also part of the solution or perhaps the only solution we have available. So in a nutshell, the ocean is really the best chance we have. To deal with the impacts of climate change, we need tools. And one of those tools is precisely the marine special planning. Uh, marine special planning, similar to marine protected areas, are area-based management tools. And they have to start from where the uh, politic uh, approach has failed. We tend to see the ocean divided in a patchwork of areas subject to jurisdiction and we forget how the ecosystem works. It works as one, it's interconnected, it's complex, and uh, every measure that we should develop and apply to the ocean should start from that premise. And therefore, when developing legislation, as we have done here in Portugal, the very first thing is to take into consideration that those precise and defi defi definite elements of, uh, of the ocean and the maritime space. In the case of uh, the link, between uh, ocean climate nexus, uh, this link has very much escaped international law. And this is important because we see different realities moving at different speeds. Uh, natural science is very precise, is very good in terms of supporting what should be done and what, how large is the threat. 
but the legal tools that have or should be developed to make sure that those threats are mitigated and at least uh, mitigated or adapt to them uh, are so far uh, lacking. For example, the Paris Agreement and the wider U United Nations Framework Climate Change uh, uh, um, Agreement does not really consider the ocean. The ocean appears once in the whole in the uh, in both texts. The same thing about climate change and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, drafted in the 70s, uh, uh, signed in 82, and of course, given the historical context, it is understandable. But again, at policy level, we are moving much faster. If we look at the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and in particular SGD 14, it's obvious that the connection is there between, on the one hand, oceans and climate change, and developing a sustainable from an ecological, environmental, uh, economic, and social uh, dimensions, of course. There is one very important contribution in terms of harmonization, and that is the EU's uh, Marine Special Planning Directive, and the recognition that climate change effects have to be considered in the development of coastal and ocean economies. And to do so, marine special plannings are undoubtedly the tool available. And for this reason, the EU put forward this very important uh, regional or e uh, e European level uh, legislation. Unfortunately, not every state has mo is moving in the, at, the, at the same speed. And there, I think that Portugal has, uh, is perhaps the, one of the foremost examples of good practices in implementing the directive. Not only we did this before the directive came into force because we approved the general act on marine special planning in 2014, and by 2015, a year before the deadline, we already had transposed the directive into national legislation. And I would like to highlight just a few key elements of the Portuguese legislation that I think combine that vision of one ocean and integrated and interconnected environmental space with that policy view on how oceans should be properly managed and how we should consider the oceans really an ally in dealing with climate change. Firstly, we approved this new notion of uh, uh, national maritime space, which includes the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. And this, of course, raises two concerns, because we did this while it is still pending our uh, submission at the United Nations uh, Commission for the Limits of the Continental Shelf. This means that this process of, uh, uh, of analysis of our submission is still pending while we are legislating beyond 200 nautical miles. It is a complex legal issue I can go into in the Q&A. And the other one is the interaction between the extended continental shelf and the water column above. And this is particularly complex in light of the ongoing negotiations for a new implementing agreement of the Convention on the Law of the Sea. So essentially, the, these are one of the key elements where you can find some novelty. How does this connect with climate change and, uh, and, and the current paradigm of MSP? The first thing is that Portugal really implemented or at, uh, at the helm of our regime is this ecosystem-based approach as a legal principle. The, the other issue is uh, climate change mitigation is one of the objectives of Portuguese uh, marine special planning regime. And I remember because I was one of the persons involved in drafting the legislation, this was a key element from the very beginning. We knew that this is where we wanted to, to from where we wanted to start and would not be uh, an ending point. So we're starting from based on this idea that the tool MSP is a valid tool to deal with climate change, but not only. The other uh, important thing is that we were not focused merely on economic uh, activities. We really had a broad vision of uh, MSP. And this is important because uh, today we could discuss MSP 2.0 in terms of not being economically focused or exclusively economic, economically focused. Of course, there are two unanswered issues, but I would say these are common to every country that has, that has an MSP regime. It is how do we legally integrate, and this is a complex issue, how do we legally integrate the environmental tipping points of the climate system into a dynamic legal regime? Because it has to be dynamic. You cannot draft and believe that the ocean will stay exactly as a date that you approve the legislation. 
So you have to introduce that dynamic element. And the other issue is how do you make those tipping points triggers inside the regime? And the last issue I'd like to point out is the ecosystem services concept in MSP. There is a huge issue I think here, and I would welcome uh, contributions from other colleagues listening, is how do we really implement the ecosystem services into our uh, strict legislation. And one example is the EU Marine Strategic Framework Directive that could actually be used to, useful. This directive requires monitoring measures, the definition of environmental targets and implementation of programs of measures, which in itself has 11 indicators. It should be noted that these are combined to, uh, to quite an extent because MSP is also a tool for implementation of the EU uh, marine strategic framework directive, strategy framework directive. I will just make some last remarks. Um, there are uh, many examples of both MSP and, but also MPAs that really only exist on paper. We failed to really update them and put them running. And by the time they're really running, we, we already uh, need to adjust to the new reality because the environment is dynamic and the threat of climate change is increasing a faster speed that we actually anticipated, anticipated, sorry. So therefore we need more action in terms of developing quickly MSP legislation that is robust and that considers the ocean climate nexus. I do strongly believe that the key to a successful ocean uh, economy is integrating climate change. And this, of course, could be achieved with a robust MSP regime. Thanks. Great, thank you, Vasco. That was excellent. Uh, really interesting to hear the, those perspectives, both from the implementation of MSP to date and the, the uh, ramifications and the kind of holes there are in the international legal sphere. And also uh, touching on those really important ideas going beyond the national jurisdictions and the ecosystems concept. Uh, immediately brings lots of questions to mind, but we'll come back for the, the kind of more uh, probing questions uh, in a moment. Um, but next, I would like to move on uh, to our next panelist to give her a chance to in provide some introductory remarks. And this is uh, Professor Kate Sharon. Uh, so Kate is, is also a professor, um, this time at the School for Resource and Environmental Studies at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. Um, she is an environmental social scientist uh, by background and really her research focuses on the human dimensions of landscape change, uh, including of course coastal climate adaptation, which is probably what you're going to hear most about today, but also sustainable agriculture, renewable energy transition and, and other areas. So Kate, really great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for, for joining from Canada. Um, I assume you're in Canada, of course, nobody knows where anyone is nowadays when they come online, but uh, wherever you are, welcome. Um, so you're in uh, Nova Scotia, well, you're, you're based in Nova Scotia, um, which, as I understand it, is a part of Canada that experiences already uh, regular flooding and faces a high risk from future sea level rise. Um, in that context, you actually already worked with us at the OECD a few years ago. You wrote a really excellent case study looking at uh, coastal infrastructure alignment, um, realignment in the city of Truro, Nova Scotia. Now, I'm, I'm British, so it's, it's not the Truro I know because the uh, Truro, I know, is a, is a quaint uh, city in Cornwall in southwest England, um, which actually has its own issues of, of river iron flooding and coastal flooding uh, on its own. But anyway, uh, your case study was on Truro, uh, Nova Scotia. Um, so I'd love it if you could tell us a bit more about those initiatives that, that were or have been and are being undertaken in Truro, how they've developed since the case study that you wrote. And maybe also you could dig into some of the broader policies and initiatives going on in the province um, about improving coastal resilience. So please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, yes, I'm in Nova Scotia and uh, I, on a place that we consider the unceded uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq. So it's called Mi'kmaq, this region of Atlantic Canada. And I'm proud to be here. I'm very honored to have this platform today and to have some time to reflect on that case study. I, you know, uh, had a chat with my colleagues who worked on it with me and I I remembered that it was about three years ago that I was driving around Nova Scotia, kind of having interviews with some of the key players in this nature-based coastal adaptation project of about 90 hectares 
Brothers uh, near Truro. And I don't know that I'd describe it as a city. Maybe it's got a little more in common with the one in Cornwall. Uh, it's quite a rural area. And so our goal was to draw lessons about adaptation from what was a dike realignment, uh, pulling back uh, with salt marsh restoration in front. Um, and the result was Canada's contributing chapter to the OECD um, volume responding to rising seas. And, and that was really worthwhile doing. Now, Truro was built in a floodplain. Uh, regular floods are naturally caused there by extreme tides, sedimentation, and ice jams uh, in the confluence of the rivers where it sits. But of course, anthropogenic causes have layered in on top of that and complicated things significantly. Um, urbanization uh, or urban development within that kind of rural context. Um, as well as, of course, uh, conversion of salt marshes to agricultural land and sea level rise caused by climate change and the increased uh, run up of, of storm surges that are resulting from that. And in fact, the Atlantic coast of Canada has got the highest projected relative sea level rise uh, in, in Canada, because at the same time, we're geologically sinking um, as, a, as a result of glaciation. So um, Truro's, the Truro case study was the first in a series of dike realignments that are underway to modernize uh, the agricultural dike land system in the face of climate change. Uh, the dike land system was originally built by early French settlers back in the 1600s. Um, the Department of Agriculture now has uh, management responsibility for the infrastructure, um, but the dikes no longer protect simply agricultural land. So it's become much more complicated. We have commercial, residential, sometimes industrial, and certainly a lot of transportation infrastructure that's being protected by dikes that are really designed only uh, to protect farmland. And so there's a, a system-wide uh, regeneration kind of project uh, going on. And so when I did the interviews in 2018, the project was really well underway. Um, the government had purchased the land in question um, after no farmers uh, were interested in buying that land. Um, Stakeholder consent had been acquired over a, a period of time, and I'll talk about that, as per regulatory requirements. They sit actually in a very particular um, regulation context. And um, much of the internal earthworks had already been completed uh, to reestablish protection further inland uh, and to recreate drainage. Uh, but almost three years later, I have to tell you, uh, the outside dike is still not breached. Um, and which will, of course, initiate that restoration process that uh, that is critical. And so the question is why? And it is a little bit complicated. Um, in this case, it was predominantly the site itself that's causing the delays and the number of institutional landowners whose interests needed to be negotiated. Coasts in Nova Scotia are incredibly uh, crowded jurisdictions, I guess. So the, for instance, there's a Nova Scotia power line that bisects this 90 hectare site and those power poles needed to be moved. And the, there's a, a rail line that also abuts the site and the rail, the rail company owns uh, some of the infrastructure. So what I guess is an interesting message is that even in a rural place like Truro and where the affected citizens have voted in favor of uh, a nature-based coastal adaptation, uh, the public land uses can even layer in challenging ways. So meanwhile, the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, which had, has bankrolled quite a lot of this work, is depending on the wetland habitat credits um, that will come out of it to offset the wetland impacts of critical transportation work that they're doing elsewhere. So the project team is currently working toward a June breach at Truro. Uh, in the meantime, in those three years, there's actually been two further smaller realignment projects have begun and finished uh, by the same team. Uh, the science that is done uh, by the, this, this larger team before and after the restorations is critical to our understanding of the ecosystem service implications of nature-based approaches like this. Um, and then kind of leaning toward that social side, the, you know, hopefully the rebuilding of what are is really kind of a near eradicated salt marsh uh, context will also help citizens appreciate their importance and be open to restoring more of them in future. So uh, the, the marsh body context is quite unique. Normally, coastal adaptation goes from like complicated to complex when the public becomes involved. And this is a real issue uh, for political will. Um, so in the Truro case, going back to this, the process was 
you know, surprisingly straightforward if it was a bit prolonged. So this is because those permitted formally to have a say in the process of changing agricultural marshland is only the dozen or two in a, in a given case who own land within the agricultural, uh, agricultural marshland boundary. And so the regulations say that these people comprise a marsh body who many of them don't even know it at the outset of such a process, but they actually have a shared duty to deliberate and vote on any changes to their boundaries. And so the engagement process in Truro, it set out the case for the work. It brought in experts to speak to any of the concerns um, of the landowners and, and plans were adapted accordingly. For instance, there's a very old um, 18th century cemetery that the plans were adjusted to continue to protect. Um, and it led eventually to a unanimous vote in favor of the project. And I think that later such projects, those other two, for instance, they proceeded relatively smoothly in part because of the mental shortcuts that marsh body owners in those other places could take that, you know, if, if, an, if a farming town like Truro could give up ag land in this way, then maybe they could do it too. But Extending, you know, such clearly delineated shared responsibility exists in Nova Scotia only for marsh bodies. It's, it's a highly idiosyncratic uh, context and it's only in the Bay of Fundy. The rest of us frankly act in a chaos of self-interest. <laughs> and this is what really shakes the foundations of political will when it comes to adaptation and retreat. And that's whether it's on public land, uh, you know, concerns about changing long existing land uses, you know, access, um, points, view planes, or indeed on private land, you know, uh, for instance, uh, limiting how close to the coast you can build or what kind of protection you can use there. And so that private land piece is particularly tricky. Nova Scotia government just bowed to very strong pressure from private landowners when trying to pass a biodiversity protection act. And now the regulations will only apply on publicly owned land, which is only about 30% of the property. Uh, the province um, and private land only where owners consent. And so we translate now to uh, Nova Scotia's uh, Coastal Protection Act, a long anticipated uh, act with under current regulatory development, and it will in part um, require coastal setbacks for new construction, legislate up to date and publicly available flood risk mapping to a high standard, among other things. But, you know, Unfortunately, we're in a gray area now as that regulatory development is proceeding, but um, people know it's coming. In the media last week, we heard how there has been a construction boom, a rush to build in risky coastal locations before those re regulations come into effect. So, you know, again, what will happen when flood mapping uh, inevitably urges retreat or rezoning? There's a lot of pressure, particularly for small towns whose coffers are pretty low after um, the impacts of COVID-19 on our rural tourism, which is significant. Um, so a few years ago, as an example, there was a 75 hectare spontaneous wetland restoration that happened near Hansport, Nova Scotia, as a result of failed coastal infrastructure. The government boss bought most of the affected hayland, um, fish passage returned, and the marsh plants uh, restored incredibly quickly. I was walking on that, you know, a year and a half in, and it was uh, really looking amazing. And so it seemed like a bit of a no brainer in terms of opportunities to retreat. And for a while, this was the provincial government plan, but hundreds of citizens showed up for public meetings, they marched, and they forced the province to rebuild the structure. And that was engineered larger for modern conditions, but even with that has already had to be reinforced once. Um, now it's one of the most heavily rocked and armored bits of coast that we have in Nova Scotia. And this is a good example of what holding the line will mean in practical terms. It's likely not the landscape maintenance that local people are expecting. And I'd be curious to know how they feel about it. But coastal retreat is what I would say the, the proverbial third rail of climate adaptation in Nova Scotia. And I'm sure we're not alone in that. Uh, it's simply bad politics to disappoint people and great politics to come in and save them when things go wrong. 
And so this will always tend toward the status quo at a time when we need large scale transformation. So political will starts with citizen will. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues in the previous session already talked about some of the challenges of uh, literacy and communication that play in there. And, you know, frankly, I could go on for quite a while about the interesting social science implications of all this, but uh, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. That was so interesting. And I think it's really important to get this kind of local color uh, on, on things and to, to see sort of on the ground what are some of the barriers and opportunities for getting stuff done uh, and implementing policies that, that, that really make a difference uh, in terms of coastal resilience. You, you said there's much more that can be said on that on the social science side and, and we'll I'd love to come back on some of that a bit later. It's interesting to hear those uh, reports on you know how people do react in their self-interest when under pressure and the, you know, the rushing to build before the regulations come in and the demanding that the dike be rebuilt. So many fascinating issues there, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but first, um, we're going to zoom out again a bit to the international level because um, our third panelist today is Georg Bursting uh, from Norway. So Georg is the policy director for ocean and climate change in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. So in that role, he is responsible both for coordinating the ministry's engagement in the international climate change policy sphere, including uh, negotiations under the UNFCCC, but also in the ocean space. So he was advising that Norway's prime minister on uh, the high level panel on sustainable ocean economy, which is what I hope we're going to hear about a bit in a moment. Um, he is a very well known figure in the climate world. Um, and I myself have se seen him uh, many times over the years in, in very important roles uh, within the UNFCC bodies and, and elsewhere. So we're delighted to have him here today uh, in also in the ocean context. So Georg, um, you know, as mentioned, uh, Norway really showed great leadership on the international sphere um, by its, its initiation of the high level panel on sustainable ocean economy, which it then co-chaired from 2018. Um, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about the rationale um, from the Norwegian perspective about why uh, the prime minister and the government wanted to launch that international panel and what you're hoping to get out of it um, and what your view is of what the outcomes have been of the panel. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh... Andrew, for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation to this uh, discussion. And also thanks to Kate and Vasco for their interesting presentations from uh, domestic and local perspectives. Uh, I will start out by saying that the initiation of the Ocean Panel goes back to around four or five years ago, when we in Norway were working on a government white paper on ocean in Norway's foreign and development policy. This led to a greater realization internally that the increase in global population means that the world will need more resources and services from the ocean in the future. At the same time, we know, of course, that the ocean is at great risk from multiple threats such as overexploitation, marine pollution, and also climate change. There was also a recognition that solutions to these challenges cannot be found only in the domestic domain, but that it demands political will, scientific insight, and also international cooperation. So in this backdrop, the original intention behind the panel initiative was quite ambitious. <laughs> it was no less than to contribute to the change the way the world thinks, acts, and feels about the ocean. It was to increase awareness about sustainable use, of the ocean and how protecting the ocean can lead to significant value creation and enable us to meet some of the world's most vital needs in the years to come. It was also to inspire policy and actions at the highest level to catalyze the transition to a sustainable ocean economy. This was all put in context of uh, making a concrete contribution to the efforts to achieve the UN sustainable development goals. It, it was important for us to have engagement at the highest political level so that all of the 14 panel members were sitting heads of state or government. And in this respect alone, the initiative is quite unique. The panel has been led by the Prime Minister of Norway and the President of Palau. The leaders appointed their personal representatives to carry out the day-to-day -day work, but this level of political ownership has created a very solid basis for the commitment that were presented by the panel in December. 
and it continues to be important as we move toward following up. It was also important for us to work closely with the UN, with the UN Special Envoy for Ocean as a supportive member, and to have an open dialogue with other countries, private sector and civil society. Uh, a core business for the panel was knowledge building. We wanted the political discussion in the panel to be informed by the best available knowledge. So we assembled a, an international multidisciplinary team of more than 250 experts representing 48 countries uh, or regions. And uh, yeah, I can add also include expertise from the OECD. Uh, the panel specified the topics to focus on and commissioned a large number of peer-reviewed blue papers and special reports to explore priority ocean issues that have significant policy relevance. Given the topic for this OCD uh, webinar, I can mention that all of the panel members, members early on raised the relationship between the ocean and climate change as a priority issue, both in context of the added threat to the health of the ocean, but also how the ocean and ocean-based activities can be part of the solution to climate change. This resulted in the development of uh, papers both on the expected impact of climate change on the ocean economy and a special paper on the ocean as a solution to climate change. And I see that both of these are referenced in the introduction to the agenda for this webinar and all of the documents can be found on the panel's webpage where we want to download. In addition to this, a writing team also developed a comprehensive report drawing on all of the blue papers showing that building a sustainable ocean economy is both essential and possible. Basing its deliberations on all of this material, the 14 countries on the panel was able to agree on a broad and ambitious ocean action agenda with transformations toward a sustainable ocean economy. Now, I, I won't have time to go into details on the content, but it, it is comprehensive and it covers action items in five key pillars, ocean wealth, ocean health, ocean equity, ocean knowledge, and also ocean finance. I think of particular importance is the headline commitment. All of the panel members agreed to sustainably manage 100% of their exclusive economic zones by 2025, guided by sustainable ocean plants and used, utilizing the ocean without sacrificing its health. This commitment is significant also in a global context because the coastlines of ocean panel members comprise almost 40% of national coastlines worldwide and they represent 30% or the world's exclusive economic zones. So the agreement covers some of the world's busiest shipping lanes, productive uh, fishing grounds, and also popular tourist destinations. But we do of course hope that the work of the panel and its action agenda can inspire and engage well beyond the 14 panel members. And there's a clear invitation from the leaders on the panel to, for others to join this effort. Now, uh, lastly, uh, I can add that the last nine months of the panel's work took place during the COVID-19 pandemic. That meant that much of the deliberations on the political document had to be conducted with virtual meetings. And I think it says uh, a lot about the political commitment to the panel's agenda that we were still able to come to agreement within the time schedule, the ambition level was retained while adding additional insight and perspectives on the resilience and contribution of the ocean economy in the blue recovery. So while the world is still uh, grappling with finding a way out of the pandemic, we believe that this political commitment is very promising as the real work starts on implementing what the panel has agreed. Obviously, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, uh, but we believe the panel has put forward an ambitious but also pragmatic 
recipe for how to protect, produce, and prosper from the ocean. And importantly, all of the members of the panel have announced their commitments and also to be held accountable on how they deliver on this during the next five years. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gail. That, that was really interesting and, and great to get that both overview of the panel and its work and also kind of the inside, inside line on how it got to the conclusion and, and where it's going next. Um, maybe a follow up uh, with a question to you straight away, actually, while we stay at this kind of international level for moving back into the other panelists. Um, you, know, you talked a bit about the overall outputs from the panel, but I was wondering in, in particular, what's your view about the, uh, what are the most important aspects of the panel's work for this question of improving resilience to climate impacts in particular? Um, and what can governments do to, to take those recommendations forward now that now that the panel has reached its initial conclusion? Well, uh, I think first of all that, as was mentioned uh, also in the first session, uh, we cannot lose sight of what is most important, and that is to drastically reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions globally. Uh, I believe that the work of the panel uh, has contributed to a greater understanding of the potential of ocean-based climate action, calculating that it could contribute to as much as a fifth uh, of the yearly global reductions needed by 2050 to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And also following up with a joint call for ocean-based climate action uh, that was agreed among all of the 14. And I think there is a growing recognition of the need to rapidly implement ocean-based solutions to climate change, such as cutting emissions from ocean-based industries like shipping, but also in renewable energy and in conserving blue carbon ecosystems that sequester emissions. But as we all know, climate change also poses existential threats to the ocean that require immediate action to build resilience and to avoid major impacts on fisheries, marine life, and well, basically the livelihoods of billions of people worldwide. So the panel, I think, has pointed the pathways to a sustainable ocean economy that will also help bolster the ocean's resilience to climate change. First and foremost, this is a question in my mind about proper planning and sustainable management of the ocean and its resources, as also Vasco <coughs> pointed out in his introduction, knowing that the ocean is an extremely complex natural system, tightly linked to land-based activities and ecosystem, it's kind of hard to see how you can build ocean resilience effectively without approaching ocean management holistically. And this is also where I see a major contribution by the panel in its broad agenda and its emphasis on comprehensive, sustainable management. And I, I would say that the vision that it put forward by 2030 to have sustainable ocean plants provide a credible basis globally for safeguarding the long-term health and resilience of the ocean while attracting investments and creating jobs is also quite uh, ambitious. Uh, I, I might add, uh, Andrew, also as an example from my own country, uh, Norway no longer approaches oil, transport, fisheries, aquaculture, and minerals separately, but monitors and manages ocean activities and nature conservation across sectors in its marine spatial planning. This helps to establish common data standards, uh, metrics, and goals. Uh, and it also facilitates coordination across government boundaries. While we believe we have a good experience with uh, this, of course, not everyone can adopt a Norwegian model overnight and uh, all type of management models would have to be adjusted to national circumstances, but the panel is clear in its recommendations and commitment to what is needed. Um, um, I could also add that uh, a particular uh, ocean uh, area as part of sustainable management uh, protection is seen as a way to build resilience so that other type of pressures are not added to those caused by climate change. So I believe that in this context, the panel's recommendation to protect 30% of the global ocean is also welcomed by many and it would hopefully 
contribute positively to some of the discussions that is ongoing uh, internationally, not the least this year in the UN Convention on Biolog Biological Diversity. Great, thank you. That, yeah, that was really interesting to get that response from you and uh, also to hear about the, the example from Norway. Um, there's more I'd like to ask you about the sort of future of the panel and also getting questions from the audience along those lines. So we'll, we'll come back to you in a moment about that. Um, but also given the way you ended there, um, sort of going back to the uh, the uh, marine protected areas point, um, we might go back to Vasco and back on more into the marine spatial planning um, that he he was was talking about. And um, one particular point you know, about going beyond uh, international uh, jurisdictions, you, you sort of tantalizingly mentioned that Vasco in your introduction, but I just wonder if you could just say a bit more about what are the, the key challenges and opportunities to, to extending MSP beyond uh, national jurisdictions um, and what lessons there are there internationally? Uh, thanks very much for that uh, question. Well, uh, uh, it's a good, um, 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 it also connects with what the uh, Georg said. I mean, the, um, as the world gets more covered by different legal regimes with different layers, national, regional and international, what we are witnessing now at the UN level is this massive effort that should be commended and tends to be sometimes uh, forgotten. Uh, that is the huge effort that's being done to negotiate a new implementing agreement of the convention dealing with uh, conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. As we are approaching uh, this reality, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will have a robust implementing agreement that we, we all hope for. That agreement, that new implementing agreement will also include area-based management tools and the possibility of MPAs beyond national jurisdiction, which we already have. For example, OSPAR uh, is, a, is a good example of its MPA network. Um, and also the, the possibility of MSP in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So it, bringing all these different regimes together, we really have to have two basic fundamental elements. One is a good understanding of legal concepts that are somehow common or a common de de denominator to every country, which is very difficult. Uh, only at EU level is, or if at the EU level is difficult, I can imagine this at a more uh, broader perspective. And the other fundamental issue, and this connects with the question that uh, Duarte raised in the, in the, in the, in the, in the chat, is we need we are developing to a new towards a new reality where natural science and, and science and good natural scientific information has to feed the legal process and those veins of communication have to be open the models that we have on msp are very much focused on a some of them are more centered on economic activities than others some like for example portugal has a you know you can only develop activities that are um, uh, environmentally uh, sustainable. And, but I think we can go further and we need to go further. Uh, and, and that's where I think that the work that has, has been done by the panel that Jörg was mentioning is very, very relevant. But never forgetting, as Kate mentioned, that there are people and coastal communities and, and, and th those are essential elements and should be also a component of the decision-making process. So in a nutshell, Andrew, what we see is that there are a lot of decision-making processes developing simultaneously with different layers of interaction. And that, that is that awareness uh, that, uh, that we, we should be focusing on and not so much as we were 10, 15 years ago, that where, where does my area begin and where does my neighbor's state area end and what can I exactly do or not do? There is a shared common interest and concern that is the ocean and the need to really have a, an ocean that is our best chance we have, not only as a carbon storage, but also in providing uh, ecosystem resilience. So I would really uh, underline and stress the importance of this interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary dialogue between science and legal uh, thinking in terms of developing robust legal instruments that really uh, can answer uh, and be dynamic vis-a-vis -vis the science that we're developing uh, every day. 
great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Very interesting insights, and thanks also for picking up on on the question posed by Dwati about um, what we really mean by MSP two two dot noughts, and that uh, yeah it was, it was very clear from from how you you answered that. Um, maybe uh, while while you you have the floor, um, an interesting uh, sort of target, sort of general but targeted question which came in from the audience, which maybe you should see how you approach it in a nutshell, which is what defines a robust MSP regime. Well, the, 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 the first uh, issue is really legally binding for decision makers, meaning if the science is telling you something, then you should follow and you should stick to that science. So it means you really have to invest in good uh, science. Uh, not only you need science, but you need good science and th that scientific uh, um, uh, inputs have to be dynamic. You cannot do an analysis or an assessment once every decade, but you really need to be feeding that good science. For one very good reason, Andrew, you need those uh, uh, triggers and you need, the, you need to anticipate tipping points uh, so that you can actually be aware. I mean, uh, uh, Kate also mentioned, and Georg mentioned, we are still seeing increasing urbanization in coastal areas. We're still seeing that uh, some states tend, tend to dismiss those important warnings and somehow we still, you know, looking with the lens that we had 10 years ago when the reality of nature has changed dramatically, the ocean has given us full warnings about what's to come. And that's really what we should be preparing. So legally binding means that, as I mentioned in my presentation, if I would take two examples, that of how do we really implement at the at legal level, the ecosystem service concept, in, this, in the context of MSP, for example, but also the importance of implement, legally implementing those uh, trigger points. Um, and those would really somehow, it doesn't sound good to say so, but sometimes you really need to restrict the, the discretion of decision makers uh, based on that good science. Um, it's not a matter of uh, alternatives, I believe, at this point. I think we really should stick to this common uh, notion that we really have to make our legal solutions uh, 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 somehow answer to the challenges that the science is telling us. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, really important to you keep coming back to this, this link between the legal perspective and, and understanding and listening to the science. Uh, that's certainly a, a key key theme here. I mean, there's, there's much, more we could get into and maybe we will in a minute about the, the ecosystem uh, approach but um kate i'd like to come back to you uh you know also tantalizing you in, in your first intervention you, you talked about uh all the fantastic experience and knowledge you have about the social science implications and and the barriers that are related to to kind of getting people on board to, to use a far too general term um so i think some of the factors you mentioned um about the Things that hold back the success of coastal infrastructure projects in that domain are, you know, play out in other aspects of policy responses to climate change. Also, you know, you see it in land-based renewable energy investments, um, the the reaction of communities kind of before and after those those developments happen. Um, I think you, you yourself have worked on some of those areas. You know, you see it more generally in kind of the carbon tax debates and the the sometimes instinctive reactions people make to anything with the word tax in, and also in, mm -hmm. in the whole forestry area. So you know, it's really wide ranging. So it'd be great to dig into that. And see where, where the implications are. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more, in particular, uh, in your experience of the of the uh, coastal infrastructure realignment in Nova Scotia, you know, what kind of strategies have been used to overcome these kind of concerns, and and what might be the lessons be more broadly for, for other regions, other countries? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I do enjoy talking about these things, and it was wonderful to hear Ellen doing the same in the last session. Um, I think a sense of threat. Uh, tends to generate very self-serving thinking, uh, which you know some researchers, uh, some psychologists called motivated reasoning. You know, uh, kind of come to the conclusion first and then figure out how to justify it, which is a much more kind of gut type thinking. Uh, but what I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the threat of climate change. Uh, I'm actually talking about the threat of regulation. Uh, and uh, and uh, Ellen raised the term uh, psychological distance, and I think that I mean that's what's playing out here is that actually the threat of regulation is closer 
it's 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 closer and it's impacting more in the cases I was sort of talking about than the threat of climate change, which is distance, uh, temporally distant, um, you know, for some, in, depending on the politics, uh, distant uh, spatially as well. And so it, it, it drives decisions more. And there's also this issue, the concept of loss aversion, which is that we tend to um, seek to avoid losses more than we pursue comparable gains. Uh, and that is particularly so when the gains are uncertain. So it, 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 it doesn't create a great context for change. Um, I've been talking about a concept called climax thinking. I kind of stole the idea from succession theory, this idea that we have um, that our current landscape is how it's meant to be. It's somehow fated. And if there's a disaster, then we need to kind of get it back to that climax point uh, rather than addressing it. Uh, and that the persistence of that should be pursued uh, and given primacy in any decision making about the future. And so it's this idea because it's the one that we have now. Um, so we discuss this kind of in theoretical terms with uh, Nova Scotia residents uh, in focus groups that were actually online focus groups last year. And we were kind of telling them about nature-based coastal adaptation options. And, and they were actually welcome. The citizens really liked the idea. They were skeptical that these were going to be viable solutions uh, in some cases, and given the severity of some of the impacts that we're seeing. Um, and so I, I suspect that the support would be much less strong if we were kind of going in and saying, okay, this is in your community, we're going to do this thing. What do you think? Uh, we're going to, right, your wall is going away and we're building a wetland, for instance. Um, back in the like, early 2000s, Martin Wolsink described kind of a U-shaped curve of acceptability around wind turbine construction. Um, you know, that there's support in general for wind energy. People like the idea. Um, but then that, that support drops drastically when it gets to a specific proposal. And then once it's built and people have experience and the uncertainty is decreased, it kind of goes up again. And so he kind of described this U-shaped curve. And I kind of think we're in the same situation with living shorelines and nature-based approaches, uh, which is, you know, in Nova Scotia, still in its relatively early days. There's support in theory. Um, resistance locally, you know, a citizen, and in some case, of course, um, politicians and, and municipal folks who are concerned about the reliability, and not enough viable examples around to reduce the uncertainty. Um, but of course, living shorelines are not a panacea either. While they seem to promise like the win-win of more naturalized coasts without the need to retreat, this idea that we can kind of cleave to that option alone is a little bit of a maybe a shared delusion. Uh, in some cases, retreat's gonna be the only option. And you know, the rate of erosion on the Northumberland coast, for instance, is, is not gonna be easily stopped by uh, living shorelines approaches, nor the run-up, the increased run-up of storm surges on the Atlantic. So um, I collaborate with a center of expertise here in Halifax called Transcoastal Adaptations, Center for Nature-Based Solutions. And we've been working to add reimagine to the common list of nature-based coastal adaptation options like realign and restrict and, and yes, retreat. Um, this is to ensure that we focus on coastal adaptation approaches that enable the realities of coastal processes to align with human expectations and needs. Um, so yes, working from ecological principles and within socio-political re realities and minimizing engineered construction as a supporting component only, but, but fundamentally shifting our land uses and our conceptions, recalibrating what makes for a good coastal life uh, and our sense of control in coastal ecosystems, which I think we have uh, not quite balanced. And so after, <laughs> that's, that's going to be a difficult sell, but that's, I think, some of the communication that, that, that needs to be done around ocean literacy is, is, is along those lines, um, not just about how wonderful the ocean is, but how powerful the ocean is. Um, after the marsh body experience, I find myself thinking that the real space for leverage is actually in improving empathy and collaboration in relatively small scale ways. So rebuilding the idea that our coastal problems are shared problems and some will need, some people will need more help than others will. So as an example, uh, in February, a student and I did a survey about that publicly available flood risk mapping that's being planned uh, for Nova Scotia. So we did this in two southeastern Nova Scotia communities with a history of flooding. 
Um, and a sixth of respondents were opposed to publicly available um, flood mapping being available. Um, they felt the impact would be an, unacceptable for their real estate value. And what was interesting to me is that the people who, so what predicted that, uh, that resistance was not believing that the flood management decisions that they make have implications for others. So this sort of really atomized view. So like water doesn't work that way. If somebody, if one person builds a wall, it does have an impact for the person next door, right? And, and so this atomized thinking, I think, is one of the big challenges of coastal climate adaptation. Uh, what I don't know is how to build that sense of collective responsibility outside of this rather idiosyncratic marsh body context. I'd love to hear any ideas that people have around that, but this idea of kind of collective action and taking uh, taking pride in that uh, was a, a, a philosopher, Rebecca Solnit, wrote about um, in, in a book called, I think, trying to remember what it's called, like uh, the, A Paradise Built in Hell, that's what it was called. And she wrote that we have an unmet need for uh, altruism. And so if we work together on things such as after a big storm or something like that, we actually get a lot of satisfaction from that um, and seeing the kind of shared project. But how do we do that outside of these crisis situations? Going back to this issue of how do we how do we do this proactively is, is a big question. Thanks. Sorry, struggling with my mute button. Uh, it was going on, off, on, off. Uh, but Thank you so much. There's so many interesting concepts there, which uh, you know, all of all of which we could we could dig into for at length, I think. But uh, you know, it's so important that you mentioned this notion of empathy and kind of a collective responsibility, and just bringing it back to the local and understanding what what makes people tick is you know is un underlines the whole climate challenge, I think. And you know, certainly bodies like the OECD, where we do this work on these kind of stratospheric global challenges and, and just trying to understand what actually matters to people at the local level. Uh, there's so much that can be learnt, you know, from, from the Truro example, from the coastal example, and then, you know, broadening it into other questions of climate change. So thanks so much for, for digging into that. Um, there's actually one question kind of related, uh, you mentioned the kind of specificities of the marsh body and the situations there, but we had a question come in um, from Peter Murray. Uh, which I'd like to ask you and actually then the other panelists, Vasco and Georg as well, their views on it, which is, you know, we've been talking about OECD countries here and specific examples. Um, and he's asking, well, what are the context of the developing countries um, and, you know, their responses and needs in terms of resilience building initiatives underway? Um, you know, if, if I understand the question correctly, you know, the, the implications for true resilience internationally really, of course, depends on what's going on in in country there's so many different contexts around the world and with so many millions hundreds of millions billions of people dependent on the ocean and coastal communities so uh you know what learnings i guess for uh other country contexts in particular developing country contexts and for you kate first and then i'd actually interested in in vasco's and georgia's opinion on, on that as well in different ways yeah, I'm hoping that my colleagues do have something to say on that. I have to apologize to Peter Murray. I didn't realize once I'd answered his question that it would go away uh, from the thread. And so you don't see the first half of it there. It's in the answered box where I replied to him and I had kind of misread the question in the first instance and and kind of was talking about the way that um, you know, in, in the case study of Truro, for instance, there were actually, there was a lot of really kind of entrepreneurial activity happening between the bureaucrats to make this thing happen. And that I didn't think that um, this issue of kind of power, uh, maintaining power uh, at that level was a big issue. But uh, one of the challenges of extrapolating my experience to a developing world context, unlike maybe somebody who's working on, a, on an organism uh, that doesn't change uh, in, in, uh, in, in a different language or something like that, is that I, it's very hard for me to understand. Uh, I haven't done work in a developing nation. And so maybe one of my colleagues has something to add to my answer to Peter. Vasco or Georg? Um, okay, um, well, thanks very much for, for, for that question. Um, well, I've, I've, I've done some work with, uh, in particular, uh, um, one small island, the Portuguese state, Santo Tomé Príncipe, where we had a course last year. And uh, I've, uh, I've seen what's going on in Timor, but also fundamentally, I was last two, year, two years ago, I was in FSM and 
and and of course you do see a lot of the input that SIDS are uh, bringing into the table at multilateral level at the UN. Um, I think that the, the major issue here is um, not only homework in terms of finding the right model, because as we saw with work, the model of MSP in Norway is different from that one in Portugal. Um, the, 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 the concerns are different, the ecosystem is different. So there are many um, distinctive elements from uh, not only from state to state, but also from the context within that same state. We heard from Kate, the reality of Canada is very different, from, for example, from what is mainland Portugal. And therefore, you know, this has to be taken into consideration. But the very important is really, you cannot just copy paste a MSP model into a, a, a country. Rather, even if it's a developed or developing country, the important thing is that the, the homework has to be done on the ground. You really need to make an assessment or, or ecosystem, of course, of what you're really dealing with in terms of, uh, uh, of the reality on the ground, but also then the legal uh, structure that has to be in place and the ability to really uh, uh, deal with this issue that you, you're putting forward in the MSP legislation. Because, um, for example, in terms of, if you want to include traditional use, you cannot, in some to Prince, you cannot build an MSP uh, regime that ignores the reality that it is highly dependent on, or, uh, communities are highly dependent on traditional fishing. You have a huge issue with illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, which of course the, the country doesn't have the ability to control and uh, exercise uh, 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 control over. And so there are many gaps, and, but doesn't mean that there is no solution for a certain country because it lacks those resources. Of course, that finding that, I think the, the best thing that, that organizations like uh, OECD can uh, deliver to these countries is not only the possibility in financing the, their own uh, planning uh, system, but also, fundamentally making the, the, the groundwork, deliver science where science is, is lacking, where there is no infrastructure on the ground to develop that science, capacity building, not only at developing the legal structure, but the scientific structure, monetization, and sharing information. I really believe that as we are seeing in social media, information is key and it's now it's become the, the model, the business model of the social media, I believe that ocean resilience depends on sharing good science. And those, those key elements are not yet developed. I really commend what Georg was telling us for, for what he's doing on his end, uh, but that should really be replicated. I see uh, uh, at the UN level, uh, certain divisions really pushing this forward. And I, I, I think that that should be something that we should really look forward to. It's really sharing of the knowledge, defend, uh, establishing the, 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 the common understanding of what the, the level of good science we need to reach and how we share it and make it uh, rapidly uh, available. Because that, again, we only have one ocean. So the, the, the information, scientific information developed in any part of the ocean is fundamental to the entire ocean. To, again, to understanding where are those tipping points? Are we really moving forward in the, in the right direction? Great, thank you very much. Very interesting. And Gail, do you want to come in on this particular point? And actually, just first, I should say that thanks to Kate for pointing out that the, the question asked um, from Peter Murray through the Q&A, it was actually the second part of a kind of two-part question, uh, beginning with this question of what is what is really driving the political will? Is it the uh, implication of uh, politicians or public servants to be uh, speaking to their power bases and, and whether that context is different in developing countries? But we've broadened it now much more generally to the implications of resilience in the developing country context. So, uh, Gail, from the panel or other experience, you would like to come in? Yes. <clears throat> well, thanks, Andrew. I, I think maybe um, uh, partly also to answer some of the questions but from uh, Duarte about uh, the next steps uh, for the panel. Uh, well, first, first of all, um, uh, I think it's important to say that uh, uh, the composition of the panel, the, the 14, actually the majority of the panel members uh, were heads of state of government from, from developing countries. So their 
uh, perspectives uh, and concerns um, were certainly uh, part of the discussion and uh, the agreed outcome from the panel. Uh, I also think it's important to underline that the panel actually has not finished its work with the report and the ocean agenda that it launched in December. Uh, the panel is now in its next phase with a focus on delivering on the commitments and recommendations. Uh, so this is partly clearly a task dealt with through domestic policies and follow up, but partly also through international cooperation since many countries and developing countries in particular uh, will need uh, support, including technical and financial assistance in order to deliver on such an ambitious agenda that has been put forward by the panel. And as uh, Vasco mentioned, uh, this is also about exchanging experiences and knowledge, knowledge uh, I would say among all, uh, all countries. Uh, and again, the 14 leaders that signed the document in December was clear in their invitation for others to join this effort. So part of the present uh, discussion uh, in the panel is how to engage with other countries uh, and actors and also how to potentially enlarge the membership of the panel towards a broader partnership with even further uh, ocean coverage. So um, yeah, I also add that part of the mission of the panel has been to support the process toward the next UN conference in Lisbon that has now been postponed until uh, June, July next year. And that will still be an important milestone and uh, an important process, I believe, for uh, all countries, developing countries in included. But the commitment is there among the panel members to stay in for the long haul. So we believe the political momentum is there and are hopeful that the engagement that has uh, started with the the started with the panel will broaden beyond the present membership of the panel, both governments, industry and actors, and certainly uh, also uh, developing countries. Great, thank you very much for answering and also for coming back to the question more broadly about the future of, of the panel, which is certainly something I was going to ask you. So thanks for, for jumping in on that. And I should just add, um, on this topic of the, the, the learnings from these various policy experiences for developing countries that I put in a quick plug for tomorrow's sessions because uh, we will be uh, getting some perspective directly from uh, both Indonesia and uh, Cabo Verde uh, in this first session tomorrow, um, looking at uh, the, the policy approaches um, for resilience. And then in the last session also uh, on the building resilience through nature-based solutions, uh, we've had some questions come in on that today, but this is clearly a crucial area, particular topic um, of coastal resilience, which is which is very important in many developing countries. So we'll certainly be coming back to those topics tomorrow. Um, Vasco, there's one question uh, I wanted to put to you. Uh, in, you've alluded to it a bit already. Um, you know, the importance of the ecosystem-based approach in, in marine spatial planning. You know, what uh, concretely do you think can be done to, to better integrate uh, that approach as we move towards uh, sort of revitalized and modernized MSB? Uh, thanks very much for, for that question, uh, Andrew. This is something that I'm actually working on uh, with, a, uh, with a natural scientist. So that's a huge challenge, not only in terms of dialogue, but actually de delivering on the goals that we've set for ourselves to the, for the project. It is extremely difficult um, because you really have to think legally outside of the box. Um, as we all know, ecosystems uh, uh, service concept is really uh, key in terms of uh, the choices you make and in terms of developing activities and in investing in ocean resilience. 
uh, how do you make that into a normative uh, option is really the, 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 the fundamental aspect. We, we say uh, uh, the, the character that applies to our discussions is that sometimes legal scientists and natural scientists, they get lost in translation because it's very difficult to transpose the reality and, uh, of the ecosystem service concept into uh, an MSP, into something that is legally understandable and therefore enforceable. Not only limiting the discretion of the decision maker, but also enlarging the input that the ecosystem brings into the legal decision making process. Um, so far, the, 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 the way we are approaching this is we are trying to refine the, the, the scientific language in terms of con conceptualization. How can we conceptually elaborate on this, uh, on this uh, uh, concept? And then transform it. Uh, and what legal principles could be um, uh, could be, could it translate into? So it is still very much uh, a work in progress. But we have identified this as one of the key issues. And and of course the the the, the example that to highlight the importance of this deals with um, the economy, the the so-called blue economy that we all that somehow have adopted since 2015 as a as a. As a, uh, as a key or buzzword that has to mean much more than just this notion of an economy that is uh, associated with the ocean. If you look at tourism, tourism worldwide and in Europe, for example, 65% depends on the proximity to the ocean. And of course, we continuously build more hotels and more infrastructures on this very small margin uh, uh, of land next to the ocean with everything else that's uh, on top of it. Uh, how do you then balance the ecosystem, the uh, services concept, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the huge amount of uh, influx? Georg gave the example of the choices that have been made in the Norwegian uh, MSP model, vis-a-vis -vis the weight that oil and gas uh, uh, used to have in, in the decision-making process. So, the, the, first of all, you need to, it's a two-step, if you would like, or two main steps. The refining the ecosystem service concept, um, translating into something more uh, uh, that you could follow, you could identify options to, um, and then of course translate it into a legal mechanism essentially. So yeah, uh, hopefully we'll be able to share the, uh, the findings of our research project sometime sooner than later. Great, thank you. I'm glad to hear you're working on, on that, and we, we look forward to hearing some of those more, more insights when they come in. Um, there's a question which has come in, uh, which actually re relates a bit back to the previous session as well. It's, it's about kind of the, the learnings from the, from the COVID-19 experience in all its different uh, facets, um, which I think could be interesting to, to address now. So, you know, it's specifically asked um, in terms of what you, uh, each of the panelists, I would ask, think, uh, how the smart city concept in coastal zones should change in light of the experience of COVID-19 and, and the, the rhetoric and paradigm around the notion of build back better and, and the kind of green and inclusive recovery, which many organizations, including the OECD, have been, have been pushing for. And um, so I'd be interested in your views on well, either specifically on the smart city concept or more generally in terms of the perspectives we're bringing today and what, what can we learn from the sort of COVID-19 experience and what, it, what it's meant for for the new perspectives on, on policy. So maybe start with you, Kate. Yeah, um, I was I was I was kind of taking a different mental. I was in a different mental space as you started your question, which was around um, you know COVID nineteen and how it has maybe transformed public discourse a little bit around um, our social responsibility to one another and our capacity to change. And so I don't know if you if you don't mind, maybe I'll take it in that direction for a I bit. Do. And that actually builds nicely on the first session as well. So that, no, please, please. Yeah. Um, because I, I do think <laughs> I, I, I did when I ran those focus groups last year, uh, it was two years ago, I should think. Um, and we were we were actually using communicative framing experiments to try to see how um, how people would respond to nature-based coastal adaptation options and the urgency to adopt any kind of adaptation given different um, 
communication approaches. And so we had three different experimental treatments, basically, that people would be in one of these focus groups uh, over. And one of the ones, the ones that were really impactful that made people really shift and think that a change was necessary in the short term um, was not the, the backward looking ones. So I won't talk about those. It was the, the ones where people were talking about the importance um, of considering the next generation, but uh, also of the kind of value of that collective action. And I think it's really interesting because that was all done before COVID-19. So it was done in the summer of 2019. And since then, uh, we've had this massive shift uh, in how we behave as a as community. And um, I don't know what it's like where, where you are, uh, but I'm in the most unusual jurisdiction in that respect. We have high trust in general in our uh, institutions and our government. And there has not been, I have not heard of a single protest uh, in Nova Scotia. And as a result right now, I would say we are, we get maybe a handful of new cases every day in my small province very different from what's happening further west and so there is there there is something um, where people are adhering to this new set of norms uh, and this new way of being without any complaint uh, I, say, I, I, I tell people that we take direction ridiculously well in Nova Scotia. We're very good at being told what to do. And, but I, I do think that there is a bit of a shift. And I'd love to explore how that has also kind of changed our sense of mutual responsibility. Because what you have seen is at a very small scale, people taking responsibility to buy groceries for neighbors or check in on people who don't have family or things like that. And as I was sort of talking at the end of my uh, initial statement, which is like, or, or uh, how do we generate the, generate this idea of, or regenerate this idea of mutual responsibility and and duty to one another, as happened during wartime mobilization, for instance, um, and and is happening right now. And I think that maybe there is some value in exploring the the actual messaging approach and what it was that drove such an effective response, for instance, here in Nova Scotia for COVID, when we haven't had the same uh, comparable response to um, flood, uh, you know, climate change or any anything else, frankly. Yeah. No, very interesting. Yeah, thanks. I think it's, it's important to think through in not only the how the, those initial responses, how people have responded and the sense of uh, shared responsibility that's come out of this experience, but also how it lasts into the longer term and how people are reacting, even as the crisis continues to unfold. I think that you know, in many countries that people responded differently a year ago to how they're responding now to those uh, directions coming in and the sort of necessary curbing of liberties and uh, you know, there's, I think big questions to see how it endures in the long term, even that can be learned from how it, it plays out right now as these sort of second, third, multiple waves of, of the disease come, come rolling through. So. Yeah, sometimes it's difficult to study these things because we, uh, as social science scientists, it's hard to sometimes get ahead of them, going through ethics processes and even knowing what to ask. And I think maybe there's some opportunity in, you know, maybe mining social media. There's a kind of a parallel field of culturomics, which is kind of measuring cultural output to understand, you know, signals about how people are um, you know how people value a place you know just to kind of analyze public discourse and there might be some value in doing some retrospective examination of public discourse uh over this time based on social media yeah. alone sure. it's fascinating data analysis can be done through that um vasco and georgs um on this point of sort of learnings from COVID 19 i'm doing uh vasco first whether from your perspective the, the sort of change mindsets we're seeing implications for how we can be better managing marine spatial planning, ocean policy more generally? Well, um, um, it's a very interesting question. I, I, from what from perspective I have here in Portugal, and there's a, a case of a municipality close to Lisbon, next door to Lisbon, that is Cascais, they've, they've really taken into heart the de uh, developing uh, marine spatial planning not because they have the legally competence to do so, and this is the, the point I'd like to make, um, the ocean has become uh, an issue not only for states uh, or the multilateral community of states, international community, it is a problem that citizens all over the world are feeling very close to home, or at least that's what we would like to believe. So cities are also themselves, they want to have a role 
um, they can't sit uh, comfortably knowing, well, it's not my competence, it's not my area of jurisdiction, I do not have to interfere. Uh, I believe that uh, municipalities like Cascais, but uh, surely others around the world will be doing the same thing. That is, well, I will not just, you know, wait for somebody else to, uh, to do the hard work and I want to be part of the decision making process. I want to be involved. I want to facilitate the, the relationship between different uh, national authorities. And I want to, at my level, at the city level, the municipality, I want to push an agenda that puts the ocean first. Um, and of course, this is a self-interest because of the, 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 all of the services that then they develop. Again, the, the relevance of the ecosystem services and that brings into the local economy. Um, but again, but it, this sense of ownership and not dependent, not depending on um, which uh, national authority is competent or regional authority is competent, but actually owning the and being part of the decision making process. Kate's uh, initial remarks on uh, uh, stakeholder participation and listening to local communities uh, underlines this very fundamental issue that people want to be involved, they want to take part in the decision making process, even if, if these are the issues that have a macro uh, level or a global level that will traditionally only involve states. And being a, 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 an international uh, public uh, law professor as well, uh, of course, this raises a very uh, difficult issue in international law, that is the role of non-state actors in the international decision-making process. And what we are seeing at the international level is that non-state actors not only are claiming their, uh, a voice in, a, in the international fora, but you also see states uh, uh, opening the doors uh, uh, to, their own, to their participation because the input is extremely valid. Um, th this is no longer the time of, uh, uh, of organizations that are uh, not run professionally or do not have access to resources. A lot of valid input is coming precisely from, from non-state actors. And this is something that should be encouraged and states should do the same in their own states by listening to coastal communities, getting them involved, being, being part of that decision-making process, because you would see at, at the state level decisions on uh, developing coastal lines or using um, or allocating certain activities might not uh, favor the agenda or the interests of local communities. So the, again, that, that, that equilibrium has to be reached but never forgetting the ultimate goal. It's really about making sure that the ocean is resilient and that climate, uh, the, 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 the ocean, uh, the, the ocean economy itself it has to take into consideration the resilience of uh, marine ecosystems, not the other way around. Yeah, very, very nicely put. And yeah, likely bring in this, this term of the, the non-state actors, which has become so important in the climate negotiations, but seeing it from the point of view of a national Government and, and understanding what's going on uh, at, at the local communities and coastal areas, very much picking up on on Kate's points about what, what really works in those areas. Uh, Georg, from, from your international perspective, just on this question of the kind of learnings or implications from from changing mindsets on on COVID nineteen and uh, anything you'd like to add there, but either for the panel or or actually more broadly, what you're seeing in the climate negotiations. The obviously the nature of COVID-19, its impacts have been very different on different countries around the world. The ability of those countries to respond is also very different. Uh, that's naturally spilling over into the kind of international policy negotiations around climate, around ocean as well. So I was wondering if, what, what you're seeing from that, that perspective. Well, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm not quite sure how to um, <laughs> uh, approach this. I'm, uh, I, I guess I have a bit of a problem seeing the exact parallels uh, between the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, these other challenges that we're uh, working on, but uh, maybe I'm not imaginative <laughs> enough. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, I mean, from from our uh, perspective in Norway, for instance, I'm, I think it's quite clear that, you know, we're facing a, a, a global challenge that, uh, we are we are only going to be able to to beat with uh, with uh, international cooperation on 
on uh, all uh, levels in order to uh, find a safe way out of uh, the uh, pandemic and, and doing so in uh, a way where we um, cooperate, as I said, and, and have a, a equ equity, equitable way out of uh, the pandemic. I, I think that's at least the, the clear thinking from, uh, from the Norwegian side. I, I could maybe uh, add, though, as, as I mentioned, the, uh, the work of the panel uh, the, and the last uh, stretch of that work, as I said, took place during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond the challenges that we faced uh, in as far as, you know, how the panel was uh, working uh, together uh, in order to reach uh, an outcome. Uh, clearly, the, the pandemic also uh, affected some of the thinking on the panel uh, as far as, you know, the what it meant for the product that we were coming out with beyond the, uh, I, I think, broad agreement by everyone that one should not let the ambition level of what the panel was working on uh, be, be lesser <laughs> because of the pandemic, but rather to focus on how the agenda, and I think it's reflected also in partly in the political document that uh, uh, the panel is, is stressing what the agenda that it has put forward in the way of the, the transformations toward building a sustainable ocean economy also will make the ocean economy more resilient towards uh, these type of shocks uh, to the world economy uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic is in the future. And I, I, so I think that uh, clearly was uh, coming into the, the thinking and the deliberations of the uh, panel's work in the last uh, months. Um, yeah, and I, I'll just also add, uh, it's a bit different uh, perspective on this, but um, this also led the panel to, to focus uh, uh, in on uh, delivering some more uh, uh, knowledge also about the uh, contribution of the sustainable ocean economy in the uh, what we call the blue recovery or coming out of the crisis, which also ended up in a special paper uh, looking at the opportunities for a, a blue stimulus. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but uh, for those who are interested in it, that's also available on the web page of the panel to, to download and have a look at. Yeah, great. I'd, I'd heard about that really interesting work on blue recovery. And thank you for bringing it back to that. that uh perspective on firstly what, what can we get out of these bigger stimulus packages and how they can act towards a, not only sustainable ocean economy and all the benefits that, that brings but also more broadly for building a, the, the resilience not only uh, to our economies but also in the context of climate change which is the subject overall of this big horizontal project that we mentioned at the start of this whole session so thanks for bringing it back to that and I do agree with you about not overstating the parallels between the COVID crisis and the environmental ones which that also came out clearly in our, in our first session. Now we're almost at the end. Um, this has been a really fascinating and very diverse discussion, naturally so. That's kind of the way we set it up to get these very differing perspectives around the, the um, uh, ocean climate resilience issue um, from, from these different uh, countries. But I just wanted to conclude by giving each panelist just a, you know, one, one minute uh, to say what you think is the, the key kind of international learning from the different perspective that you brought today. Um, so you know, what was your kind of number one learning here? So maybe Kate, I'll turn to you first, please. Yeah, I, geez, that's hard. I, what I was thinking about uh, when my colleagues were talking there was, I, I think I've spoken a lot about kind of the community, the fine grain stuff. And I think what I emitted kind of connecting to is that um, we need to uh, kind of attach meaning larger meaning to these smaller scale transitions and, and sacrifices that are going to have to be made. And, and a lot of that meaning, and maybe going back to that COVID story, a lot of that meaning is coming from above. And so if we kind of draw the parallels with the Dutch Making Room for Movement program back in the 2000s, that there was an overarching uh, meaning uh, that people could attach their own 
um, experiences with. And I think in this, uh, we learned this also for COVID is that the meaning has come from above and then people have found that they've been able to you know, find that shared space uh, and and support one another in sacrifice. And so I don't think it's necessarily, we need, we need people to be able to plug their own experiences into a larger initiative. And so these large scale things that my colleagues are engaged with are absolutely critical. Thanks. Great, thank you. Very, very concise and interesting insights. Uh, maybe Vasco next, please, for your, for your one minute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Kate said. Uh, for me, it, it became obvious that the three of us, we, 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 we had a, the, the key factor that the, the ocean has to be the center of, of the equation and our future as uh, the future of humankind depends on it. And we are the ones that can actually make the change and just give time to the ocean to develop resilience and actually help us get out of the situation that we are in. It won't probably will not happen in our generation, it will be probably the next generation, but that share of uh, common goal and that, and now we just need to share the tools to make sure that everything, everybody is actually pushing towards this, the same direction. So I'm really grateful for their insights. I, it was really a, a, a fantastic learning experience and um, again, grateful for the invitation and honored to be part of this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your fantastic insights. And and then Georg, please. Well, I, uh, thanks, Andrew. And I, I think maybe um, my comment at the end, uh, I think, is to point to uh, how crucial uh, research and monitoring uh, of the ocean, uh, and including its role in the global carbon cycle continues to be for sound uh, policy making and which was clearly very heavily recognized by uh, the panel we also believe that uh, the uh, global expertise that was pulled together in an impressively short time by the panel is not lost even if the phase of delivery of excellent papers is over the material that was produced is readily available for anyone who's interested and I know that it is being used by individual panel members, for instance, in their domestic processes. And I would therefore also like to add at the end that uh, uh, a recent analysis that was prepared by uh, IOC, IOC and UNESCO uh, documents the synergies between the ocean panel and the ocean decade. Uh, this analysis illustrates the role uh, that the Ocean Decade will have in contributing to the ambition of the Ocean Panel and identified areas where mutual efforts can be aligned to develop a guiding framework for ocean action to achieve, in their word, the ocean we want and need by 2030. So I think this is a very useful illustration of how one can optimize collaboration efforts and respond to emerging demands for robust ocean knowledge that is both relevant and necessary to achieve a sustainable ocean economy. As is, of course, the analytical strength and expertise of the OCD. Thank you for bringing that to the, at the end there, but, um, and also for ending on that, that kind of big picture item. Um, so thank you again uh, to all the panelists. I've really enjoyed um, this sort of jumping around the levels from the, from the local to the national, the international. Uh, uh, it's so important to be thinking along these different levels of governance and, and what influences the decisions being made at all those levels. So really thank you again to Vasco, to Kate and to Georg for your, for your excellent insights. Um, that brings us to the end of today's program, um, but please uh, do come back and join us tomorrow. Uh, so it starts at the same time again tomorrow, so 2 p.m. in Paris time. Um, and we have a third session, so starting kicking off right away at two o'clock, um, looking at policy approaches for building economic and climate resilience in the ocean context post COVID-19. So looking um, specifically at the some policies around the emissions reduction angle and how the implications are for different uh, ocean-based sectors, which we haven't really got onto yet today, um, looking more at, at the resilience of coastal communities with some specific insights there, um, and uh, really uh, del del delving into these uh, ocean-based sectors. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned before, our final session will really drill into the particular area of nature-based solutions. Um, it's come up today already several times, and it's, it's such an, an important area for uh, coastal resilience and the links between the uh, 
actually links overall between climate change and mitigation and adaptation. So I look, for, look forward very much to those sessions tomorrow. Um, I will sign off there and say thank you again to the panelists of both our sessions today. And thank you to also our directors and the ambassador for the excellent uh, opening remarks. And I look forward to seeing many of you again on Zoom tomorrow. Thank you.